Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Marco Martins Revolution. Now, this episode of The Revolution is brought to you by Vodcast TV. Vodcast TV is Johannesburg's premier shared podcast studio platform where businesses and individuals can tell their story in a consistent and compelling manner. In the interest of full disclosure, of course, I am the founder of Vodcast TV and simply my whole vision behind the entire Vodcast TV project was to create a space where people who want to create their own high quality podcast could do just that without having to worry about microphones, cameras and all the technical bits required to create one. All of our Marco Martin's Revolution podcasts are recorded here at our Vodcast TV studio in Rosebank Mall. And this is your chance to create your own high quality podcast just like this one. Whether you're an individual, influencer, marketer or a business owner, there just simply isn't a better option for creating your own podcast in Johannesburg. All podcasters retain full ownership and control over all their content, advertising and sponsorship revenue as well as their IP simply with the permanent space, equipment and studio engineer to provide you with all the technical support you could need. Visit vodcasttv.com right now to arrange a studio visit and book your first podcast today. It's really, really simple. Just go to vodcasttv.com right now. Right, so my guests today were Damien and Lara Harry. Uh, they've both uh, suffered from symptoms of TLE, which of course is temporal lobe epilepsy. And we had an in detail discussion about that and how it's affected their lives from childhood all the way up to their adulthood now today. And it really was a compelling and interesting conversation. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Give it up for Damien and Lara Harry. A revolution is a fundamental and relatively sudden change in political power. An organization which occurs when the population re re revolts. revolts. This is the Marco Martins Revolution, powered by Vodcast TV. Visit VodcastTV.com for more. Uh, guys, welcome to the podcast. We've got uh, Damien and Lara, and we're going to be talking about uh, TLE and living with it, mostly. Yeah, temporal lobe epilepsy. Fun times. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about you and what you do first. Okay, so my name is Damien Harry. I am currently a multitasking person, I guess. I teach full-time at a university, I'm doing film and acting. Um, then I teach part-time as well. Um, I do social media and events for some restaurants, acting on the side, what else? Very and, cool. Yeah, I'm just doing. What, what brought you into teaching? Was it more the video side of things? You were interested in film, video, doing something creative. Look, you've always been inclined to go towards creative, uh, some sort of creative uh, outlet for your career. But beyond that, was teaching also another calling? Was it a combination of the two? Um, I think the teaching kind of started when... Um like in 2012, I just ended up, I had like, was a pretty crappy start of a year. And then I just ended up traveling around the country and just backpacking and missioning around pretty much homeless for a right, year. Right. Um, and then I spent so quite a bit of time in the trans sky. And I don't know, I just remember there was this conversation with some old village dude. And he was just saying how bad the education was. And then actually having the experience of then later teaching in the trans sky, like in a little container school. Mm -hmm. and just seeing how bad things were. You know, I always had that bit of a try to save the world right. idea. And then I was just like, okay. And I came back to Joburg and just went straight into a teaching job. Saw how screwed up it was here as well. So you never studied education? You never studied teaching or anything before when you started um, in it immediately? Or did you, was it something that you studied a little bit before? I did study a little bit before. Um, in varsity, I did. I was actually like a trained dancer. I was going to be... I mean, yeah, proper dancer. What genres? Um, it's contemporary, just like anything. So I right, did physical right, right. theater. So it was just theater dance mm -hmm. and all kinds of stuff. We did ballet, contemporary, hip hop, like everything. Right. And then um, later in 2012, I had a bit of bad accident. I came off the bike and spent like a few days in hospital. Uh -huh. um, and then I was just kind of too scared to dance again because the, the plates kept popping out of my, out of my collarbone. 
So it's yeah, unreal. So you you were on a motorcycle, and you you came off the bike. Yeah, there was some sand in the road, and I tried to like turn and stop, mm-hmm. and then went onto the grass. I didn't realize there was like a three meter drop into a river embankment, so I just pulled brakes and just rolled, tumbled, and went. It's yeah. horrible. <laughs> so this was in early 2012. Yeah, it was. It was about March, March 2012. No, no, I lie. Sorry, it's 2013. 2013. 2012, I was traveling. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is obviously after varsity for you. You had already been dancing. Uh, you were looking for a career in dance at the time, or yeah, I, w- I was also. Um, but then also with the dancing, we did. Uh, it's called it was called dance dance culture and education. So I got mm-hmm. my facilitatorship, where I had to like actually design curriculum and do that kind of stuff, which I think is what helped me get more into the education because I said, hey, look, I can design curriculum for you. Okay. Um, and then I just kind of stuck with it. And then I went from teaching at a high school to teaching at an academy and then from the academy to a remedial school, then to now to tertiary. Um, so I pretty much, I think like my main idea is to eventually, at, you know, sometime in the future, open up my own training college for teachers. Right. Because something that I have realized with our education at the moment in the system is that teachers are taught what to teach and why they teach, but not how to teach. Okay. Which I think has, is a big problem. And I've seen that through all the schools, all the places that I've been at. Because people, schools will hire a teacher just because, oh, okay, no, this person studied English at varsity. So now they're just going to make them teach English. Um, well, when I want to come back to that in just a second. Laura, you, you and Damien, obviously a couple. And it's yeah. something we didn't introduce this oh, as. Sorry. It's, uh, this is Damien's partner, Laura. <laughs> uh, Laura, what industry are you in? Um, I'm a photographer working in reception actually okay <laughs> yeah so i'm not really working in the, the industries that i've studied at all right but yeah but also once again another creative outlet and and i think this is something that might bring us back into the discussion with the tle a little later on that perhaps it's something why uh, someone with epilepsy may may be looking to pursue cre- creative careers rather than something more traditional just because mm-hmm. of the way you function from from that situation of the upbringing. Let's come back to education because it is fascinating. And uh, I want you to delve a little bit deeper into your description of how to teach versus what to teach. Like uh, we're talking about curriculums and talking about, uh, we could use an example of science where you keep being given the real uh, physical information almost as if you're being taught as a student yourself, the teacher. It's, you know, this is chemistry, this is how it works, what 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 he has he has the textbook, this is what the information you need to relay to those students, and then this is how the tests work, rather than uh, delving deep into the children themselves and how to get that information across. Mm-hmm. So I mean, this is this is purely me. This is just my observation of it from from what you're saying. I mean, you can you can delve deeper into this and perhaps give a better description on your views on that. Um, yeah, so I would say <clears throat> that the, we're, we're still stuck in that like parrot learning style of education, uh, where you know it's like okay, here's a textbook, you need to know this. We, like the kids don't really know why they have to know it, and I mean there is still a lot of stuff that we are that kids are learning in school now that isn't relevant Mm -hmm. that they're not going to use later on in life Um, and I think that also deteriorates their the 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 kids approach to being educated you know they're like why must I learn this what's the reason of doing this right I mean like you know like when when last did we use trigonometry Uh, I think yeah if you're not an engineer trigonometry is not like sort of part of your your daily life and uh I think there's a lot of uproar and uh, from greater community globally for people to be learning more functional education, such as uh, learning about credit, learning about yeah, dude, uh, like that's what we'd rather be learning things like that. Uh, in terms of its benefit to you as an individual, although I think of what a lot of educational systems are probably their approach would be is that that's something learnt at home. Uh, but that's based on the assumption that people are learning these things at home, whereas they aren't necessarily. And that's, I think that's probably mm. one of the big downfalls is that um, these are the things that uh, from a parental side should be covered, which at times it's not, at times it is. And I think for those with the parents who are giving them that sort of coverage, they have a massive advantage over mm. the rest who don't. And uh, But in saying that, 
I think it's about getting the message across that even if you are doing a curriculum that doesn't have a lot of practical application, just the ability to learn things mm. is, is a skill in itself. So trigonometry is not a complete waste in the sense that your ability to uh, decipher whether it's from a geometric pattern, from a mathematical standpoint, things like that, it, it does have value even though not in its real physical application. Yeah. So, so that is like kind of my approach to education is that it, it should be more, I don't know, hol holistic. It mm -hmm. should be applicable to like daily living, to stuff that, you know, a child needs to know. I mean, in high school, we should be learning about taxes. We should be learning about how to deal with this stuff. So when we get into the real world, well, not into the real world because everything's real. Yes, but once so you start, act, you know, getting your post-education world of, you know, uh, yeah, dude, I mean, like, a contributing member of society. Yeah. And like I learned how to do my taxes like two years ago and I was very happy and surprised to know that the taxman pays me. I was like, what? what? <laughs> he has to pay me? I don't have to pay him? <laughs> what? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, but like my approach, because, because now at the moment I'm teaching a lot of acting and film. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually really teach acting. I teach people how to be people. So I'll teach, which I think actually comes from my experience with the epilepsy because you know, especially with temporal lobe, you're prone to like mood swings. You're prone to like experiencing feelings that you're not sure why you feel it. Like you wake up one morning and you're just super depressed. And you're like, what the hell? Why am I so depressed? I'm having a good day. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of have to remember and relate and relay and be like, oh no, just remember it's your brain. It's telling you this, but it's not real. So the temporal lobe uh, epilepsy is something that you were born with. This is this well, was a condition you were born with or it's something that can be caused out. by trauma as yeah, well. Yeah, it, hey? can, it so. can definitely be caused by trauma. Like for me, there's, I've been trying to f figure this out for years, but we've, I've lost count of all the things that could have possibly, because I had a very bad infection when I was about six mm -hmm. um, that led to me having a high fever and getting being delusional and jumping in the pool with my clothes on num numerous times and ending up in hospital for like a few days to being dropped on my head when I was uh, like one years old or something. So there's a whole range of things that could have been it. Right. But the, eventually I just stopped worrying about that and started being okay, here, let's deal with the actual right, issue. Right. It's than, actually, yeah, there's, there's, there's no practicality. There's no benefit to knowing where the symptoms started or, or what caused it necessarily because the treatments would be all the same yeah. anyway. Um, and then Laura, you also uh, suffer from yeah. TLE. Yes. Um, I think I was probably born with it. There's mm -hmm. lots of mental illness and things in my family going way back. Um, all different sorts, but pretty much related, really. Right. Um, I can't think of any traumatic events or head knockings or anything that right. could have really caused it. Mm -hmm. um, From a physical trauma sickness. And as far back as three years old. Um, and TLE, is it necessarily hereditary? Uh, is it one of those things that sort of skips a generation? Um, is it just purely dame luck? Uh, some people more prone to it due to their family history, things like that. Uh, it, it can be a mix. It can be a mix of all of them. Um, from the research that I've done so far, is that yeah, there is hereditary versions, which are mm -hmm. actually quite rare. Right. Um, then it goes. Then it's all your basic like trauma, um, like tumors. Any, anything like like if you have a if you have a fever for long enough you, there will be damage done um, right because you know your body's not supposed to be that hot for that long yeah. to just you know bump in your head when you're like two or something yeah so I mean this is of course what we're talking about when, when we mean trauma it, it could be uh, the physical trauma of an actual strike or a knock to the head you know brain rattling around in the cranium uh, we're talking about uh, infections, fevers, things like that. Could that could be the trauma that causes that? Yeah, it could be and emotional then trauma. Emotional right? trauma as well. Yeah. Uh, of course, none of us are qualified neurologists. We're not qualified doctors. We are only working off of information that we've gathered. So anyone who is suffering from any symptoms of epilepsy, uh, you should absolutely go and visit a neurologist mm -hmm. right away. Um, or if anyone's experiencing some things that you could perhaps explain from your childhood and yours as well, Laura, that uh, if they experienced any of those similar symptoms, it's possibly that you could have uh, yeah. a, a version of TLE. Yeah, um, like I remember, I remember actually explaining to some kids in school, it was Ricardo and them. Right. Um, and this before I even knew and real, or even knew that it was. Um, I remember explaining and, and this saying, is in primary school. Yeah, yeah, I remember explaining, saying it feels like there's a dam in my head. You know, there's like a like a dam, and mm -hmm. the and my emotions are the water. 
And then what happens sometimes is that the dam overflows or overflows mm -hmm. and floods. And then like you, you, it's like you lose control. You're aware of it. You can like, you know, you're awake and you're seeing it happen, right. but you're like, you know, your body's just doing things without. So you feel like a passenger in, yeah. in this rather than being in control yourself. Yeah. Okay. And then for you, Laura, were your experiences, mm. I mean, obviously you, you and Damien being a, a couple and in a partnership, you've mm. obviously discussed this more in depth. Uh, were your experience very similar to his in your childhood or, uh, you know, in mm. some cases, yes, some cases, no? Yeah, most cases fairly similar. I mean, we had pretty different childhoods, so it sort of showed, the right. symptoms showed up in different sort of ways. Um, but what he was saying now about sort of being a passenger like I spent a lot of my childhood kind of feeling like I was sitting up in the clouds watching my life as a movie. Mm. Um, <clears throat> like I wasn't actually a participant in it. Mm -hmm. It was like this act played out for me. Um, Which yeah, is obviously quite... Third person. You, you know, these descriptions are actually quite far uh, stretched away from the general consensus of, oh, okay, well, epilepsy is a fit when flashing lights are happening. You mm. know, you, mm. uh, this, is, this is what epilepsy is. This is... The, the most common uh, public perception of someone with epilepsy, well, okay, your, your suffering is, is completely down to uh, you have seizures, you know? And uh, I think seizures are probably more manageable in daily, as long as it's not happening as a very regular occurrence. You know, once in a while I have a seizure, got to lie down as long as the people around me know how to prevent me from from yeah. really physically hurting myself doesn't seem like the end of the world to to most people but um in terms of daily life having these emotional disconnections uh yeah. and how that can d force you to uh segregate yourself or distance yourself from colleagues and from uh, personal friends, family as well. I think that starts to paint this picture of difficulty, especially for young people. Yeah. Mm, I think, I mean, I for one, I haven't really ever had any physical seizures, like sort of convulsions and things. Um, and with that comes a lot of misdiagnosis. Um, I mean, when I was small, like I said, about three years old, I was taken to the doctor because I was running around my mom's bed screaming. Um, and she sort of stopped me and said, Laura, you're okay. And apparently I just looked straight through her, like she wasn't even there. Um, and obviously with family history, she was a little bit worried. And at that age, the doctor already said I was showing early signs of schizophrenia. Right. Um, later on in life, it was diagnosed as depression, then bipolar, um, all sorts of things. Because without that physical seizure, a lot of people don't quite understand. And it's difficult for them to align it to... Uh, TLE necessarily without that seizure as you say yeah, you know? yeah. and then um, of course a lot of those diagnoses aren't from uh, neurologists necessarily yes. they're a lot from psychologists yep. or, psychologists, or, or psychiatrists, psychiatrists as GPs well, as well. To, uh, from a psychiatrist standpoint uh, it's difficult to and, and I'm going to say something horrible but necessarily lead, let them off the hook for a misdiagnosis like this because obviously mm. a big part of their practice is brain scans and all of those things and it's, it's perhaps something that would be more likely to be picked up by a psychiatrist than a psychologist whereas a psychologist is just sort of dealing with having a conversation with you uh, talking about your symptoms and things and then obviously those mimic uh, quite closely a lot of other conditions of like depression, yeah. schizophrenia, things like that. So the psychologist is sort of advising you to go visit a psychiatrist. He's probably had a discussion with the psychiatrist beforehand and said, look, here are my findings. You, you go ahead and, and use this information to diagnose yourself. Um, but certainly TLE is something that's more treated by neurologists. Yeah. Also, um, something that a lot of people don't realize is that like your depression, your bipolar and stuff are symptoms of the TLE. Right. So they like, you know, the, the, the person can have temporal lobe epilepsy and then something mm -hmm. that, you know, how it, how, the outlet that it has would be depression, depression bipolar. Because, yeah. I mean, so with temporal lobe, it's, you know, there's damage within the temporal lobe. Mm -hmm. So that affects your memory, emotion, um, all that kind of stuff. So you know, a lot of people like that's why where that a lot of that misdiagnosis comes from is mm -hmm. because, you know, oh, we see you have this symptom. We don't know why it's there, probably. Right. So we're just going to treat that symptom yeah. instead of treating the actual it issue, can, which is... It can be a symptom of, of the mm -hmm. TLE, but it also is, you know, still on its own, a standalone Yeah, yeah technically thing. it's not um, a misdiagnosis because it is yeah. actually something yeah. that you have. Yeah. Uh, it's just that the issue comes in where 
we're human beings. We don't just want to figure out what we've got. We want to treat it. Mm. Mm. And uh, treating uh, depression that's caused by TLE versus treating depression directly, um, the treatment itself would be less effective. Mm. Yeah. Um, look, yeah. Um, so with the, the depression, that the treatment can be quite different to the treatment for bipolar or TLE. Um, bipolar and TLE have very similar... Um, no, I can't think of the word. Very similar treatments, though. Um, whereas okay. mood stabilizers are very similar to to the anti-epileptics. Um, the thing is, what's helped me a lot now is knowing that it's not chemical misba- imbalance, but actual electronic, you know, okay, miswiring. So, in so the brain, it's it's the which, firings of uh, neurons and things like that. That uh, the pathways, the neural pathways, yeah. aren't necessarily activating in the right way and things like that. Um, and you guys, uh, personally, you've, uh, we've had a discussion slightly about this before and not really in detail. Uh, you've gone through quite a lot of treatments yourself, Damien, and, uh, yeah. from a medical, yeah, pharmaceutical so standpoint, and then as well as from your own research, etc., uh, going for more holistic and, and herbal versions. Yeah. Um, so when I... Like also 2012 when I came back from traveling and stuff and my parents thought I was batshit crazy I booked myself into a queso mm-hmm. you know just because I also I wanted to experience and see what it was like and to see okay am I as bad as, as they make me or you know what is what is out there and uh, instantly they put me onto Psylift which I don't know people like it there are people I know that have good reviews about it and good interactions with it I personally didn't have any um, and I really regretted actually taking it because what was what was really weird about those kinds of um, you know treatments is that you don't you don't feel the difference you don't notice it yourself but everyone else does. Right. And I remember like friends saying to me like you're not yourself like what what what's going on I'm like what do you mean I don't understand right because you don't you don't notice it. Um, and then I went and I started traveling again for for a few months and I you know I just decided you know what, screw it I'm just gonna go cold turkey and that was terrible. It was right. like a like a three week come down okay as, as if I'd been out partying for like five months straight and that was just you know just from taking Psylift it was you know waking up and feeling like your head's about to fall out um, being disorientated confused all the time and it took like you know a good three weeks for me to kind of come back to reality and understand okay so that's what that was it's not I'm not I'm not going crazy it was just you know it's the effect of you know coming off that substance so since then I've always just had a bit of a for pharmaceuticals um, but yeah I've, I've always I've been a big advocate for um, cannabis treatment mm-hmm. from pretty much since the when my granddad died from cancer um, I still remember you know getting laughed at and mocked and stuff about saying you know this stuff can help it'll help treat certain ailments and stuff mm-hmm. and we're like oh no it doesn't do anything and now we're living in the age where you can go to clicks and buy CBD oil yeah so obviously CBD being the the component of cannabis that's mostly beneficial from a health perspective. CBD helps uh, primarily with anxiety uh, and then it can also help with certain symptoms of uh, especially pain and nausea for people who are Mm. getting cancer or cancer treatments, things like that. Uh, And then obviously some findings stating that CBD helps reduce uh, certain Mm. types of cancer. Yeah, I would say that it helps reduce stress. Mm-hmm. And if you reduce stress, you're reducing the acidity in your body. You're reducing like a lot of tension that is in the body. And the, you know, the more tension your body has, the more it's going to run into malfunctions and things aren't going to work properly. Mm. And that's what I've noticed with the, with the TLE is that when I'm stressed or when there's a lot of complications happening and lots of things happening all at once, the brain is just like, oh, no, sorry. And then it goes, and, and then you have that misfire. Your symptoms worsen yeah. from the TLE. So uh, do you find that, say just your your regular daily life if if you're in a happy place just because of uh, situational joy you know you just things are going well my career is doing well my relationship's great uh life's just treating you well you know sort of the balance of life is more along the pros rather than the cons you automatically experience less symptoms from your tle or is that not necessarily the case um i don't know i think it it, it depends because like like before I started like treating myself and started to you know start looking into it more I didn't even know that I was having seizures it was actually only when I moved in with Lara 
And, you know, I used to just think it was bad dreams. I thought it was, oh, okay, you know, my jaw is stiff because I was, I was clenching my jaw in my sleep or, oh, no, I had a bad dream, so I bit my tongue. Whereas when I was like, living yeah. with Laura, she was like, you're actually having seizures in your sleep, like, yeah, in the proper full, yeah. like... Mm-hmm. And Three yeah. o'clock in the morning convulsing yourself off the bed. Wow. Demonic possession kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's also something, is that I see that, that especially within your more, like, tribal and traditional mindsets... Right, and still in today, I think this is the scary thing, is that uh, a lot of us in, in more uh, modern societies, more civilised cities like Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, Pretoria, uh, we have this perception and, and an understanding that, oh, people with epilepsy in medieval times were treated as if they uh, were possessed by some sort of yeah, demonic uh, spirit, things like therapy. that. Right, because of their lack of understanding and their uh, very hectic uh, beliefs into the supernatural and the paranormal and uh, their lack of scientific understanding just made them immediately uh, move towards this direction of saying, okay, it's a demonic possession. Mm. Now, the real scary thought is that things like this are still happening today in more rural societies in South Africa. Dude, it's still happening today. Like my students that I teach, like there are some and I can see, like I know that they have epilepsy because they're having seizures in class. Mm -hmm. Like like especially in the acting department, I don't know why, but it's like as if they're drawn towards it. But I think it is. Yeah, this is something we wanted to discuss, like I said earlier on, is that it seems like there's a a compulsion to to seek out creativity. Yeah, because you're you're seeking out this way to express what you're feeling because you don't know how to to say it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen like, I mean, like we'll have at least like five seizures a year where I get called in and I'm like, D, someone's having a seizure come running through and like okay let's do this do that and you know the kids almost sometimes end up just you know they'll they'll leave school for a few months because they're going to initiation right and they go more into that thing which i can appreciate as well because you know there's there's still uh holistic treatments that they use you know just not the scientific way if right. you know how to if I'm not so, so they, they have a, a lack of understanding necessarily from a fundamental standpoint but because of their access to to holistic treatments already before they actually have some success in, in helping yeah. these people anyway and, and I think also like a lot of it is that they, they, they'll teach the, the, the kids how to deal with it differently you know so say if you you know your mood swings and stuff or whatever instead of it being like oh no it's, it's a mood swing it's a chemical imbalance or an electric like impulse mm-hmm. it's your ancestors doing this so the the, the 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 paradigm is still being used to treat but it's just it's not you know the it's not the, not the scientific method or something right um, and i've seen like i've seen students come go in for like go for the initiation and go and start doing their, their training and stuff and come out like you know, way better and understanding and knowing. And I'm like, okay, well, that's fine because you're, you're, you're dealing with it. You're, you know, you're coping with it. How you cope with it, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Like as long as you're not in danger or endangering someone else. Right. Now, Laura, uh, Damien's, obviously his story seems to, to bring us to a point where, uh, we, we see him very obviously speaking about his, uh, combat, with, uh, with modern medicine. You know, uh, mm. Damien seemed to have a, a lot of uh, adverse effects, uh, whether it's from his own personal uh, fear of being treated, his own uh, distancing himself from those sort of treatments, or perhaps one bad experience sort of puts him off the, the whole thing. Whereas your story seems to align you with, you, you have this, uh, the, this sort of comfortable place with it, and it seems like it's mm. because you've been experiencing these modern medicine treatments since since youth um yeah so i look we put i put well me and my family put off going on to medication um for sort of as long as possible tried the homeopathic route natural med- medicines and remedies um until i sort of got to the point where it just it wasn't enough um i think i was about 16 when my gp first put me on to antidepressants it would sort of work fantastically for two weeks uh-huh. and then stop working and you'd have to up the dosage um, till it got to the point that he couldn't up the dosage anymore as a GP and sent me to a psychiatrist. So, um, sorry to interrupt that. So this two week period was just from start to where it stopped being effective and then yeah. the, the increase in dose would make it effective again yeah. uh, at that point. So it's not like it was a hormonal change where it would be two <clears throat> weeks at a time. Because uh, obviously, with females, especially at the age of sixteen, the hormonal changes can be yeah, yeah. can be really rapid. Uh, it was so, more almost sorry that I 
<clears throat> that I was almost immune to it. So the initial like kick in mm-hmm. kind of almost fired. Right. So, so your sort of your your body naturally developed an immunity or, yeah. or a, a, you know, the, made the drugs less effective over time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, then so then I was sent to psychiatrists and same sort of thing again until so yeah my my sort of history with pharmaceuticals hasn't always been pretty. I was put onto a really bad combination. I mean, it might work for some people, definitely not for me. Of medication, I landed up in hospital during my prelims. Um, so my matricula was a bit of a mess. It was in and out of hospital, all sorts of. And then, and then once again, from what Damien was saying, is that uh, stress seemed to accelerate a lot of his symptoms when he was living a stressful life. Mm. And then obviously, prelims a very stressful time yeah, for yeah. you. That there might be an association there as well. Yeah, no, definitely. But also, yeah, just the sort of combination of things, and also um, pharmacists putting the wrong time of day to take medication oh, and goodness. yeah, taking something that's pretty much likened to um, cocaine at night and then the chill down one in the morning didn't quite work too well. (laughs) That doesn't (laughs) seem like a good combination if you're working during the day. Yeah, lots of different combinations and treatments. Um, You know, I was treated for bipolar as well. Um, Finally sort of found things that worked. But again, I don't like relying on things um, like that, if that makes sense. like some medications, if I was a few minutes late in taking them, I'd be like shaking them into my mouth like a like a meth addict. Uh-huh. Um, where am I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. No, no. Uh, so actually, I don't I don't have anything against medication. Of course. Um, but I also I am against it being sort of shoved onto people um, and these super easy diagnoses. And yeah, just have this; it'll fix your life. People need to, you know, mm-hmm. learn properly how to, you know, what's going on. You can't just fix everything with a pill. I think that this is this is sort of a general consensus for most, especially young people today. And uh, when, you, when you look around the internet, a lot of people are of the belief that, uh, especially mental illness, is far too quick to be treated from a pharmaceutical mm-hmm. standpoint. Uh, then there's a, like a lot of lobbying against the pharmaceutical companies, especially because they're so hugely profitable, which is massively upsetting for anyone who's suffering from mental illness. And then, uh, a doctor prescribes them something that's now uh, not benefited them really at all and then someone's actually profiting from it is, is massively frustrating. Mm-hmm. So hence why I think there's this acceleration in this anti-pharmaceutical sort of movement. Um, and then of course with pharmaceutical companies lobbying against natural uh, herbal treatments and things like that. Uh, and you know sometimes along the lines of uh, benefiting society so you know marijuana usage in a way of course drug addiction things like that although marijuana has been hugely misrepresented in those ways it's not a drug addiction like uh, crystal meth or or heroin things like that it's not as dangerous but of course THC does have some negative effects Mm -hmm. it has some positive effects for people who are trying to enjoy a high from THC but THC can be quite negative as well so I think there's this sort of balance point that we need to reach where Mm -hmm. uh, the internet is fighting back against everyone who's been lobbying against marijuana far too heavily and sort of over defending it yeah Uh, and then you've got the other direction where it's sort of treated like this sort of devil devil lettuce (laughs) that it's called you know (laughs) the devil's lettuce and uh uh, you know, meanwhile, it has numerous benefits that we discussed earlier. So I think that's sort of where you were going with it is that you, you're you not against mm. sort of pharmaceutical companies, but you sort of just want the practitioners to be more uh, aware of what they're doing, sort of. Uh, you, yeah. you found frustration from yourself and obviously from a lot of stories you've heard that these sort of medical practitioners are very fast to slip a pill down someone's throat Uh because it seems to be like either the easy route for them, uh, something along those lines where we feel because it's something so serious, someone's mental health, it's their ability, especially as young people, when you're 16 mm-hmm. years old, you've got such a critical point in your life from your emotional well-being for the rest of your life. You know, your, your neural pathways are still forming, your temporal lobe is still forming, you know, up until the age of 25, you've, mm-hmm. you've not fully formed. So, you know, we're making people adults and... Uh, at 18 you're allowed to drink and drive a car but your temporal lobe isn't fully formed and and you're consuming alcohol which could do huge damage as well Mm. so 
all of these things, and I'm not saying I think we should revisit law and say, oh, okay, let's change the drinking age. That's, that's not where I'm going with this. It's just about creating more education and more awareness and, and people being more open to discussing things like this so that people who do have TLE, like Damien, you were saying earlier on, that there's, there's many people with TLE who are experiencing symptoms and they themselves are misdiagnosing themselves and sort of trying mm. to just get by their life as they've gotten accustomed to Whereas if they actually went out and sought out help and sought out some education for mm. their symptoms, they'd get to a point where they're, they're more functional. Mm. And I think this is something that I wanted to bring up now. Uh, do you two both find that you're at a very functional point in your life now? You know, you, you found a, a much better balance to your medications. You, you're a lot happier and more stable now than you have been in the past. Definitely on my side. Yeah. Um, look a lot more balanced. I mean, it's not like everything's, you know, perfect scales of balance. Um, it's like a juggling act. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like a juggling act. Okay. I mean, sometimes you will drop the ball on one side and, you know, mm-hmm. but in the more or less, it's pretty balanced. Okay. And then, Damien, do you find that you're, you're at like a very functional point? Obviously, you're, uh, you're, you're a freelance employee. So uh, balance isn't something that you would normally associate with with any sort of freelance Mm. worker in terms of life, but in terms of balance with your condition. Yeah, but I think that that kind of lifestyle also brings brings the balance. Right. Because, you know, I'm a dancer. I love dancing. Mm -hmm. So that's also how my life kind of plays out. Like I do work full time as well. And then I just have other freelance gigs at the same time, which helps Mm -hmm. keep me busy which I enjoy, like as long as I'm not stressed being busy because right. once it's something that I don't know, like, you know, if, you know, things start going wrong, then the stress starts. I'm like, oh shit, okay. And then it's not just the juggling anymore. It's now placing and putting this there and trying to sort that out and making sure this happens and that, that, that. Um, but yeah, definitely a lot more balance compared to, I mean, up to about like, you know, five months ago. Right. And wow. Like, so it's very recent for you still. Like, yeah, the, 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 but even before that, it was kind of balanced. But I mean, like in like 2014, 15, that's, I think that's when I really, well, from 2012 until like 15, I was proper like, I just threw myself into the chaos. I was like, so you that, know was what? A, that was a massive point of chaos in your life. Yeah, was like a lot of there. chaos. And then obviously before then and since then, you've ebbed and flowed between this point of, of balance and harmonious and sort of functional living mm. and, and worse points and better points and, and you continue to ebb and flow through this. Yeah, it's like like now it's just, I've become more accustomed to the things. So I know, okay, that, okay so that's what that is. Mm-hmm. I don't have to like, you know, I don't let it get the better of me. Like, I'll know, like, okay, if, if I get into, like, a depressive cycle or something, I know, okay, that's no, fine. Like, in, in, like, a day or so, I'll feel better. It's not, you know, I'm not actually depressed. I'm not, nothing's wrong with life. It's just, I'm having that, it's just a cycle, which is something that I, re- that I you know, appreciate and got used to. Because before, I didn't, you know, you didn't really notice the cycles. But then once the pattern started repeating itself, then you're like, oh, and then I'd know, I'd start recognizing the auras that would come before it, like, you know, this, the, the, it would happen. And I'd be like, okay, okay, I must be prepared because I know now within the next day, I'm going to probably have a depressive cycle or a manic cycle or whatever. So I've gotten to the point where, you know, I'm forcing myself to balance my head all the time. Like I don't let myself get too excited and I don't let myself get too depressed. Okay. I try to keep it. In, in saying this, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, you didn't discuss any sort of bipolar symptoms that you had experienced. This is something we discussed with Laura. And from what you're explaining now, obviously, it seems like you, you've also experienced bipolar symptoms. Did you know me? You, you, you knew me in school. Yeah, I knew <laughs> You know, the whole freak outs. And so those freak outs that I used to have were technically seizures. Right. Um, because so, it was, you know, the break, the, the, the dam would flood and you'd lose I, control. I think we, we were very lucky in terms of from a schooling perspective. And although uh, to be in school today with your symptoms would be much easier than, mm. than when you were in school because of the understanding is so much greater and quite a lot broader than what it used to be. Um, but still in terms of talking about being in in a place of luck you were at least we were a very open-minded school quite well educated okay perhaps a bit religious from a standpoint which might not have helped you with epilepsy like you've got a Satan in you that's it so um, we were at a, quite an understanding place and I think a lot of our year uh, I, th- I remember us all clearly having an understanding that you had epilepsy and that uh, certain 
uh, twitches or triggers or, or things yeah, would things happen, would you know, like uh, we'd be playing sports on the field and you would have a seizure. And I think a lot of us were made quite aware of what to actually do for you when you had a seizure to prevent you uh, coming into any further injury yeah. or, or anything like that or injuring yourself or someone else. Uh, so I think that's quite a positive thing to, yeah, to take that, away from that. I think that, that also you know, helped a lot as well because... I mean, when we were small kids and still in grade school, then it was different because everyone, you know, was throwing comments and slander and dissing right. everyone. Yeah, so this is in the 90s. Mm. Um, but as we built up into the very late 90s and the early 2000s is when you, on a personal level, uh, received a lot more understanding. Yeah. Like, yeah, I did. I remember, like, I used to get, like, to be called by the, called, my parents were called in by the principal, like, every, like, week or something in primary school. Right. Whereas in high school, like, you know, the teachers got used to it. Everyone kind of knew what it was. And that, that I appreciate that so much. Mm-hmm. Like, high school was so much better than primary school. But that's also because mm-hmm. then I had more of an understanding. You yourself had, yeah. had more consciousness towards what was causing it. Yeah. But uh, I know from, from things you've, I've come across from you recently is that you created a lot of isolation because of those early years. Yeah. It's because, like... you. I don't know, it, it, you, it, I f- it, like you feel guilty about it. Mm-hmm. You know, you feel like, like, it, like in Laura, Laura, like she experiences all the time. She's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing. It's just, and she kind of knows now, like if I say, no, it's nothing. It's just, and she knows, okay, no, it's fine. It'll, it's just me having a disassociation for a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's also because now that my herbal supplier has closed for only opening now this week. So it's been a bit of a, a jolt and a ride because I wanted someone to have a good Tough holiday. Tough December. Yeah. All right. So it's very difficult for you in those those remedies that you've that you've come across from a herbal standpoint. Now you don't have access to that sort of treatment. You weren't able to bulk stock yeah. up on any of that and keep it available for you when when accessibility was poor. Yeah. Um. Pretty much. So, but also because I'm I was a lot more accustomed because, like, say, Laura had a lot of the the treatments and stuff. Whereas I didn't. My parents were never like, you know, let's treat him. Like even when I was diagnosed when I was like six or eight, they never put me onto medication. Right. So like, no, it's just it's 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 little epilepsy. It's small. It's nothing to worry about. Whereas you know, later on in life, it progressed. Was this now? Was this because of um, a, a misunderstanding from their standpoint as well? Once again, to the sort of greater societal thing where you're not having many seizures, so your epilepsy yeah. is like uh, you you have little epilepsy because the main symptom of yeah, the seizures is something that's not reflecting very often with you. Yeah, so you know, I'd be having pedimal seizures. So those are your um, focal seizures. It's a, it's the small things like your deja vu, your memory loss, your emo- emotional swings. Um, what else was there's like a few like you know these little things that people wouldn't really think were part of epilepsy Mm -hmm. whereas like those freak outs that I used to have were you know bordering grand mal seizure because now grand mal would be all it's called the tonic clonic seizure so tonic as in your body goes dead and stiff and then clonic Mm -hmm. and starts convulsing Um, those only started coming through later on in life so sorry so now, now that we've we've given these descriptive words so you can have a tonic seizure in itself and a clonic seizure in itself or do they always represent themselves together or is that just the most common sort of way Um, as far as you understand so from what I understand so far about it is that your um, the tonic clonic is it's that's the you know the thing that people are used to it's right so what happens is your body just goes stiff Mm -hmm. and then it starts convulsing so it goes from the tonic which is your the to the clonic which is the convulsing and shaking and getting all demonic and shit okay. um, whereas like your petties and your focal seizures are you know that staring off into the distance becoming very disassociated and I used to do that a lot in school like I'd be sitting and just be like right well um, I myself was diagnosed in, in school with ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and, and probably something you were diagnosed with as well along with the stream of, of uh, symptoms that you were experiencing and uh, I think there's also a lot of misconception to ADHD, mm. you know. So, for example, as I said, it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where as you get the hyperactivity disorder, which is which is more common and uh, more widely known. So as soon as you say ADHD, people automatically think you were a hyperactive kid. Mm. You couldn't sit down, you couldn't concentrate, and you'd just be running around like a crazy person. And, and uh, this was the common ADHD, which is something that I didn't have either. Yeah. The, the opposite, where I couldn't concentrate, uh, I didn't have great ability to concentrate. 
but I was a lot more passive, mm. uh, I, uh, like a lazy, you know, I had this mm. perception of being a lazy child, you know, you'd, you'd be submissive and you'd sort of sit down in class and just sort of space away as if <laughs> yeah. you, were, you, you couldn't pay attention and it was something I struggled with. Uh, and then I was placed onto Ritalin. And uh, of course, a lot of people have a lot of bad things to say about it, and I don't think it's for everyone. Once again, this diagnosis of so easy to put people on medications that they shouldn't be on. Uh, once again, going back to the education system and talking about how this sort of very structured traditional education system is great for some people and others it really is not great for. And I think if you have ADHD, uh, you're just this lazy child or stupid or yeah. can't keep up and it's not great, you know? Um, Whereas, you know, perhaps there is a little bit of, of you being disinterested. I think I found that my ADHD symptoms were much worse in geography class than it was when I was playing drums or music yeah. or something that I really enjoyed. So once again, along those lines, is like, was I just not interested? And, you know, mm. ADHD, uh, I had this chemical imbalance where I was scanned at a psychiatrist. I had the brain scans and they said, you look, you do have this chemical imbalance. Uh, so, of course, the Ritalin improved my, my school grades drastically. I went from a very inconsistent student of getting A's in term one for the same subject and the next term failing it completely for one subject. So I had these massive waves of inconsistency, mm. whereas when I was on the Ritalin, I was a pretty solid high B student, you know, like 76% throughout on yeah, grades, yeah. on everything, and I was very consistent. Um, and something that I didn't notice was the changes in my behavior. And it's something that you mentioned earlier when you were on the medication. You didn't notice how your behavior had changed. And that's people around you who said, are oh, you okay? Like you, you're functioning differently. And mm. it was my mother who identified it immediately and said, his personality has gone. You know, he's, yeah, he's now a robot and, and he's lost everything that made him him. And for what? For school grades? You know, yeah, like what's yeah. the payoff here? Um, so that that's just my experience with with uh, treatments for mentally active uh, medications, um, and it's it's funny how it aligns quite closely to you as well. Yeah, I did. I mean, like it's yeah on point. <laughs> that's that's what it is. Like you just like that's what happens. People are like, well, who like who are you? Mm. Like my parents loved it because I would just sit in the lounge and be like. And watch TV and just be quiet. And, and it made it easier for them. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's, and I think that's what it is. But also, now that I've gotten to this age, I have to remember and realize, you know, my parents were young, dude. My mom was 17 when she had me. My dad was 21 when he got involved because my, my sperm donor, like, you know, buggered off. Right. Um, you know, and once you get past that now, especially at this age, you know, I understand and I have compassion for it. And I, and I don't blame them for anything. Mm -hmm. I'm actually grateful because, you know, they did what they could. I mean, because Jesus... If I had, I mean, if I had a kid now, I wouldn't know what to do with it. Right. You had very young parents. You went to a very good school. And once again, as we said, you were lucky enough to sort of be in a certain situation. So it's, you're, you're at this point of at least count, counting your blessings yeah. um, instead of uh, counting the curses, you know. So um, especially I think it's easier to look at in South Africa. Um, to, to see compassion in your parents, etc. when you see so much adversity being experienced yeah. by, by other people where uh, a lot of them don't have father figures in their household at all. Uh, a lot of them come from very poor societies. Uh, a lot of people with epilepsy are raped to get demonic yeah, people out of them. That's insane. Uh, older women who have... Um, uh, Alzheimer's disease or any sorts of dementia are raped to get these sort of demons out of them and out of their system. It, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I think this is what sort of brings us to the point where we're like, well, we're very lucky to actually have at least had the understanding and experience that we had. Dude, so, so there's this exercise that I do with my students, especially when, it, when we have to start doing um, like emotional scenes and stuff where they have to, you know, tap into emotions and it has to be this heart drenching scene. Like my, my, my brief to them is like, by the end of this term, you have to make me cry. So I do this exercise where everyone sits in a circle. And it's kind of based on the whole NA, like the Narcotics Anonymous mm -hmm. circle, uh, where, you know, you share a story. So, so the, 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 the exercise is, is that, you know, we sit in a circle and everyone tells a sad story. But they don't say if it's true or not. Right. You know, because then no one ever, you don't have to ever judge or question or anything. It's just, you know, tell us a sad story. And dude, like... You know, after doing it for like a few years, you get to know who's acting and who's not acting. 
Mm -hmm. and like the stories that I hear like especially about that kind of stuff about it's from the ladies from the girls dude it will like it's it's very like yeah young girls in particular have a very difficult time in South Africa we have a very patriarchal culture um, and a massive lack of consequence for people who break those bounds um, especially because the culture and the society protects it I yeah. think uh, you'll find a lot with very young people that the first time they are victims of a, a sexual misconduct or anything, they will approach an adult about this. The problem is that the first approach, the first adult they approach either doesn't believe them or doesn't want to take any action against the other adult who's committing these sexual And then offenses. also something else is that people don't notice or don't notice, that they don't know. Mm. Like, I mean, I was, you know, molested when I was a kid by my babysitter. I didn't know that that's what it was. You know, I thought I was like, oh, I'm just cool because I've got an older girlfriend. It was only years later when, you know, I was doing a therapy course and I was doing training and stuff and we had to, you know, tell our life story and all your earliest memories and everything. And someone said that and said like, okay, now listen, now think about this. What if your kid came and told you that story? And suddenly I was like, oh my God. And then you reached deep and, and saw the effects that it had on you through your life. Yeah. And then you started realizing and all these things start making sense. And you know, I'm, I'm super grateful that, that I had that moment, even though it tore me apart and ripped up my whole life and changed everything about how I thought, you know, because then you start like, okay, what's real? What's, where's the denial? What, you know, what is real? What isn't? What did I imagine? What did I dream? What was an actual memory? Because if I didn't notice that, then I probably would have ended up going on a path where I would have been super self-destructive and, you know, not just self-destructive, but like sadistic and end up becoming this you know crazy as dark person mm -hmm. because there was you know there wouldn't have been a you know direction to say like that's not the path you should go down mm -hmm. whereas when that happened and I had that moment of like oh geez then I was like crap okay and I had to reassess my entire life and like go back and be like okay and start noticing um you know what caused what where where the where like you know the breaks were and you know how to redirect them and change the direction of that process um and i think that also you know could have an effect on the epilepsy because you know your memories your emotions everything what people don't seem to realize is that they that it's physical you know mm -hmm. there's that it's it's a chemical it's an electrical impulse in your brain it's neurons connecting to each other uh, very very especially with young people so uh, neural pathways can be greatly affected by emotional trauma or any sort of uh, emotional effects for young people because the neural pathways are still forming hmm. uh, one of the bigger th things is that we actually have physical trauma that affects our neural pathways and, and sort of changes the way you perceive and that's something that we sort of misdiagnose a lot of the time we think okay you're depressed because sad stuff happened to you that hmm. makes a lot of sense to us um, but we look at so like military vets coming back from Iraq and uh, not knowing why they uh, have PTSD, post-traumatic post yeah. stress disorder. But meanwhile, we all automatically assume, well, you saw horrible things, it makes sense that you would be suffering from this post-traumatic stress. But meanwhile, it's actually from a physical trauma, not it's a post-traumatic stress disorder from physical trauma, from shockwaves, from blasts. And their testosterone levels are incredibly low now because their bodies yeah, are, has is, well, the neural pathways have changed to go into a sort of survival mode because of the trauma. And now resetting those pathways can be very difficult. And I think this is, again, something that, uh, like you say, you are uncertain on whether you had uh, your, your TLE from birth whether it was caused by a sort of a fever, a, a knock to the head, any of these sort of physical traumas, or if it, an emotional trauma. But certainly it, it seems like it could be a conundrum. You know, yeah, it, it could like be... Like they all just add, it's an amalgamation mm, that eventually amalgam just led to the point where your brain eventually, like, you know, when I got to like 26 and stuff, where the seizures actually started kicking in. And that was, you know, yeah, it was like 26, 27 when I was that chaotic period. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, freaking, yes, dude, I'd be doing a gram a night. Freaking, but it was also, I was working seven days a week, like from seven until nine at night. I'd be like teaching, running, or like going, traveling 150 Ks a day, just going to different schools and stuff to do classes and then still come home and deliver pizzas all night in like a very dodgy neighborhood. 
you know, resentful, dude. Mm-hmm. I was living there. I was in like the crux of everything, you know, waking up to gunshots every night to, you know, just seeing crazy shit, dude. Um, and I think that's eventually what did, you know, do that final trigger where the mm-hmm. brain was just like, uh-uh, sorry. And that's right. when I started having full seizures. And I remember I would, I would have uh, petty mal seizures like while I was teaching. And then I started getting really scared because I was like, shit, what if I have one while I'm busy driving? I'm on a motorbike. I'm on the freeway. I'm driving for like 60 Ks to get to a place. Mm-hmm. What if I have one then? But then I also started learning coping mechanisms like breathing techniques. And I'd know, okay, I feel so an aura is, you know, it's a prelude. It's like the, it's the trailer to the, to, to the seizure. Mm-hmm. And you'd get this like weird feeling in your stomach and, you know, things would just not seem right or, or you'd feel disassociated. Like you wouldn't, you would know something, but you wouldn't recognize it. Right. If that makes sense. And then I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, shit. Then I start doing breathing exercises. And that, like that, that goes back to that holistic stance that, you know, I didn't just suddenly be like, oh, look, I'm going to do this holistic thing. It was because these are coping mechanisms that I learned throughout the years to deal yeah. with these things. Things that were helping you individually yeah. and in, in a small way. And then once you, now that you're incorporating them all together, all of these various uh, holistic methods that you, you're now using collectively, you, you've reached a more functional state. Yeah, I mean, like now, no, I can put myself to sleep within five minutes. Mm-hmm. Whereas before, I'd be lying in bed and like, you know, thinking like okay what about this and then you your brain's like constantly running which i think comes back to that the adhd thing mm-hmm. it's like your brain's just constantly right you've very distracted easily distractible yeah. ways your, your brain's constantly in another place rather than uh being able to focus on an individual yeah. thing and this is probably where the breathing exercises help yeah dude bring it back to the body like you know realizing okay just remember it's not it's not real it's you know it's your brain telling you this because you have all these things happening so take a step back come back to your body you know focus on your heartbeat and i think this is something that a lot of kids should know as well and be taught Mm -hmm. in school is to be that come back so people call it say living in the moment where that all it really is is just remembering you're in in a in a biological physical body you know experiencing this existence and there are ways to you know it's like any machine you can treat it uh, treat it tweak it change things about it to suit the different mode or system that mm-hmm. you need to now go into so you know i'd know okay breathe in for four seconds and i do the counting one two three four out two three four which i think also came from dance and doing voice mm-hmm. and vocal training and stuff um which is probably why i fell in love with it so much was because it actually was helping I just didn't realize it was, mm-hmm. you know, I was like, why mm-hmm. do I feel so good when I do this? Oh, it's because, you know, you're treating these different symptoms and all these things that are happening to you. Okay. No. Oh. So Laura, you, you sought out a, a creative outlet as well in your youth yeah. uh, and you got quite heavily into photography. Yeah. Um, dance as well. They job in my youth, particularly dance, it was such a great outlet. Mm-hmm. Um, also because it did kind of it merged what was going on in your brain with your physical. Mm. So, you know, it's not these separate entities anymore when you're using them together. Um, and the photography as well, um, just, I mean, I've always loved photography, but getting into the sort of fine art side of photography um, and using it to depict what's going on in my brain is really mm-hmm. useful. I mean, one of my favorite... Um, photograph photographic series of mine is called tripolar, and it's all sort of showing the different segments of yeah of how my brain works and wow. the the emotions mm-hmm. and biology behind it. Okay, and uh, this is something that you actually because you enjoyed it so much uh, through high school, obviously the very de- developmental stage of ourselves is where we're really starting to explore ourselves. So uh, when you tend to start these creative outlets in high school uh, and you become passionate about them when you finish high school your your sort of post education mm. was directed very much towards it yeah yes yeah. so I did I studied photography um, we were talking earlier about how you know the freelance lifestyle sort of mm-hmm. suits Damien with that balance with it shows how like everything you know we've got the same the same condition but it's mm-hmm. different in our different personalities because I tried to become a freelance photographer and that didn't work with me. Mm-hmm. Like I myself need, I need something solid and, um, and more structured and more structured. Otherwise mm-hmm. I just, I lose myself. I 
kind of just disappear into it and go into dreamland and don't quite exist. Right. So for now, me now for me, it's sort of more of a hobby and a, right. a sideline so, thing. So something to sort of distract you. And I think it seems to me from this conversation that a lot of it has to do with consciousness and distraction. So uh, being conscious of what's happening to you and then distracting your mind fr- to, to try to pull it away from, from these places that you go, to try to pull it away from having the seizure, try to pull it away from, from the symptoms and things like that. And, and for you, sort of the, the chaos of, of this freelance and the expulsion of physical energy, and, uh, it, but then along with the calmness of breathing is, is once again something else to focus on rather than allowing this to take over. You're now focusing on your breathing and it, it's sort of mm-hmm. this consciousness meets distraction phase. And then for you, obviously, the, you, you're conscious of, of the conditions coming as well, etc. And the distraction is, is this, uh, this consistency, the structure that you have mm-hmm. of, like, of work, you know, the, the structure of knowing 9 a.m. I'm going here and that's, that's quite a good distraction for you as well, whereas yeah. the freelance chaos didn't work for you mm. at all. So it's sort of that, um, my language just disappeared, <laughs> <laughs> the routine um, mm-hmm. of the sort of full-time employment kind of thing that really, that helps with me. It's without that routine that I mm-hmm. really get lost. But at the same time, not so much the chaos, but stress. Right. I thrive under stress. And I think that's because, I don't know if we mentioned earlier about brain not creating enough adrenaline right. and, and in stressful situations my brain does that so I almost do better right. and when that stress subsides then I hit a low okay. and then suddenly I'm not as, as functional so mm-hmm. it's more the routine of a you know a permanent position and someone telling me I need to do this this and this um, when it's left it for me to figure out so up it's in, mm-hmm. up in the air and no way and then a, a physical expulsion of energy, is this something that helps you guys quite a lot as well? I know, Damien, dancing helped you quite a lot, which is, which is uh, incredibly grueling physical exercise, dancing. Uh, is that something that helped you a lot, just sort of get out all of this excess energy and, and mm. brings your, your mind back into a focal point? Yeah, like it, it did. And then when I kind of had to stop dancing, it, you know, I went to that, that actually kind of explains it because it was straight after I had the accident and I stopped dancing that I you're went into You're unable to expel any physical energy because you're in a hospital bed sort of recovering. And then, you know, for the next like year or so after that, I just it went into chaos. It was that, that dark chaos, the not the nice being able to, you know, deal with it. It was, I guess, you know, I just I threw myself in. I said, okay, well, let me see if I survive. Mm-hmm. Whereas now... You know, I'm shooting a lot. I'm doing, you know, trying to do a lot of projects. And that's now become the new physical expulsion mm-hmm. is that, you know, I'm having to, when I'm teaching, I'm active. I'm, I'm running around class. I'm doing exercises. I'm doing all this stuff. And if I'm not doing that, that I'm shooting, and which is then now like, you know, being up until like two in the morning, trying to like get the right shot, getting the, the camera going, making sure the actors are doing what they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then also like it's something that I do a lot is I still play music. Right. Like every morning I'll sit and play the guitar for a bit. And mm-hmm. that, that is something that I really like, I have found a lot. And I think that also comes from that dark chaos period because it was the one thing I did have. You know, it was the one thing I could go home and I could just sit and I could sit in my room and I'd like had a little bachelor pad in Resentville and I like souped out the whole place. I put like pillows on the windows, everything. I made mm-hmm. like a little studio. And I would just sit there for like hours on end and just play music just sit there making music, just find beats, doing whatever, making mm-hmm. this weird, weird trippy music and just carry on playing because it kept my mind off it. And it also wasn't so physically, you know, grueling, mm-hmm. but it was keeping that flow. It was keeping the neurons just, you know, flowing like water instead of like rushing like a river. Yeah, there was like a creative focus. Yeah, and then you could also direct it. You could like change. So if I want to do, you know, sometimes I'd be like, oh, you know, I feel like making a happy song. Mm-hmm. I just sit there and I just play until I found like a nice beat and tune that I liked that made me feel better or like you know no, I feel like making a somber song I feel like making a sad song let's do that and you sit and you just make it and, you know just because I think what the, the, the thing in with creating stuff is that you know people you remember that your neural pathways are like roads mm-hmm. they're like physical actual little things that are there it's not just in the ether and coming out of nowhere it's like a road and if there's a you know there's an obstruction at the end of the road and you're going full speed, you're going to hit that obstruction, which is then what becomes your seizure. Mm-hmm. 
So by being creative, you're learning ways and you're creating new pathways. You're creating new roads that go around the obstruction, mm-hmm. which is something that I also realized was that, you know, you could feel when you're on the, on the road to a seizure because you're going down a certain neural pathway. Right. So you just have to like reverse a bit and then, you know, find a new path around it, mm-hmm. which I think helps a lot. And uh, we, we've been discussing in quite a lot of detail um, the, the major chemical treatments. So we've been looking at holistic treatments, f- uh, as you were saying, CBD, that has a major impact, major influence, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, major influence. And then we discussed recreational drugs as well, uh, major influence. Um, but along the smaller, uh, less influential side of things over quite a broad span we look at things like our nutrition diets and things Dude, like that massive mm. like massive massive influence um so uh, like uh for me we coming in here we knew we were going to be discussing these these uh, mental illnesses or mental disorders that you guys uh f- functionally live with uh, every day and i saw you were drinking an energy drink coming in here and and i sort of immediately questioned that knowing that we're going to have this discussion is uh, this the effects that stimulants can have on us uh, from a mental side of things or from a dietary health side of things etc and then laura that's where you brought up that your neurologist uh, advises you to to find this adrenaline that you say that you, yeah. you thrive under and uh, that's a surprise to me I mean, obviously, he's not saying, you know, go drink 20 million energy drinks. Of course. Um, but because my brain doesn't create enough adrenaline to sort of keep it going the way it should, seeking out things that, that do help it create adrenaline is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, with, you know, to an extent. Um, the other thing is, is exercise. You know, you were talking mm-hmm. about physical exertion earlier, that getting to, you know, exercising to the extent that you're creating um, adrenaline definitely helps with the, the mental stability. Right. And then, Damien, you, you got quite animated when I mentioned diet and, and just general nutrition. Did you go through any stages where you were, like, maybe in a fast foodie sort of binge, your nutrition was poor or anything like that? <laughs> this this week. week itself. <laughs> okay. Um, but, uh, but it's, it's the, you know, like, I'm a sucker for punishment. Mm-hmm. Like I know that this is that this is what it's going to do to me, but you know I really feel like KFC right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like it's your body just saying, okay, I want that. Mm-hmm. Which I guess is because why I love spicy food, right? Because it has that kick. You know, there's mm-hmm. that like, oh yes, I can I can feel that, and you start sweating and you know active and stuff. Um, but it really it, like I know it does have an effect because also when I was working at the remedial school, mm-hmm. you know, I was you know teaching kids who had conditions that I have. And having to deal with it, like, I mean, dude, like, if one kid forgot to take his pill in the morning, that entire school would break out into chaos because it would just, you'd watch it spread. Mm -hmm. And then we also noticed that, you know, with the lunches and stuff, we'd see how the different lunches would affect different students. I mean, a lot of people are allergic to certain things. They don't even know that they are, Mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, I feel so depressed. I'm like, what did you eat today? No, I had a, 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 a role with whatever, or as a lot of people are actually, you know, gluten intolerant or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they think, oh, no, if you're if you have an allergy to something, it's going to be, oh, you're going to break out into hives. But it's not always that, mm-hmm. you know, the, sometimes the, the symptoms that come out, it's depression, it's hyperactivity, it's all this kind of stuff. So it is about, you know, finding a balance of you know finding what works for you. Mm-hmm. And like a lot of people just listen to your body, your body will tell you. You know, there's sometimes like Laura's. She's she's quite vegetarian, whereas me, <laughs> I need my meat. Oh. Like I'll so, get times where I actually sit there and like I start craving. Like you just, you, I don't know. It's like you just your head just focuses. Like I want a steak. I think that's probably uh, iron or zinc along those lines. It's something that you it's get very, yeah, zinc, quite a lot. Zinc. zinc is quite big in organ meats. So for example, a lot of people who start craving kidney, liver, things like that, you you're probably quite low on zinc or iron. They're very mineral rich organ meat uh, which vegans and vegetarians tend to uh, have to supplement because you don't get enough zinc and iron from your your diets in a vegan diet Mm. Um, but uh, talking about these sort of symptoms where you're talking about a remedial school and you're talking about like your your TLE and and the effects that diet has on that you can actually look at your gut microbiome and, and the influences that has on it so for example gluten 
where we have this massive war on gluten and everyone's talking about, well, we've eaten uh, bread for thousands of years and everyone was okay. You know, yeah, why, all of a sudden, why is everyone thinking? <laughs> well, uh, agriculture changed quite a lot and our glutens are quite a lot more complex gluten protein than what it was. You know, yeah. if you look at a wheat plant today from an average farmer, it's quite a big bushy uh, wheat plant, whereas ancient Italian wheat or Egyptian wheat, which they were importing into ancient Rome to create bread, they were very thin stalks uh, of wheat. And the problem with that is we have a lot of people to feed. Yeah. So it's very difficult for farmers to actually have enough agricultural land to grow enough wheat, to create enough bread, to feed everybody. So we have these GMOs, which also everyone is so magically, wonderfully against GMOs. But they, but they don't organism. understand like, what, what GM, like, it actually is. I mean, yeah, like, I think take a watermelon 100 years ago to a watermelon now. Well, take a cow, which never actually existed. A cow is technically a GMO. It's something that human beings created. There was no such thing as a dairy cow. You know, humans uh, bred between you know, yaks in, yeah. in the mountains just and like, sheep and like, this and that and eventually you come out with the modern day dairy cow. So look, the dairy cow is, is a GMO. Um, GMOs have also saved the entire populations of all sorts of fruits because uh, there was uh, a mango in Hawaii which was attacked by a virus and scientists created this GMO uh, mango which was immune to this virus mm. and with no negative effects. So we have this massive war against GMOs and there's certain GMOs that are very good. And then you look at GMO wheat, which is causing massive uh, gut problems for many mm. people. Uh, we look at dairy and the dairy intolerance of most people as well. And I think this is something to concentrate on is people having a very healthy diet. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not very anti-bread. I think that you can have a little bit of access to bread as certain people, like you say, have a massive intolerance to gluten and they should stay away from breads and mm. pizzas and things like that as oh, much yeah, as yeah. they can. Um, but uh, complex sugars, very processed foods, mm. I don't think any of that's going to be good for, for any sort of mental illness because your, your uh, gut flora or your gut microbiome isn't a very harmonious place to live in and that actually affects your mental state as well. Yeah, and... Um yeah, <laughs> what's really funny is because um, after I traveled India, which was, was like 2008 or nine, and you get daily, you get daily belly, like there is no way of, mm-hmm. of avoiding it because you like you're not every, you're not used to it, and and you can get it straight from the water, let alone from yeah, it's just any from touching else. the water, like mm-hmm. even like rinsing your mouth with like we couldn't even rinse your mouth with tap water. You'd have to have bottled water to rinse your mouth when you're brushing your teeth. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like the one day we were traveling, walking along the Ganges and stuff, and the, the person I was traveling with, and we saw like you know a bunch of sadhus sitting on the side of the river, and we're like, hey, let's just go chill with them. And they're like, oh, you want chai, 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 chai. We're like, yeah, 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 let's have chai. Guy walks to the river where just like 50 meters away there was the pyres and the, where the bodies were put in and everything. He walks there, takes the, the, this big like, you know, metal tin. Cleans it in that river. Water. Nah, no. He goes, he takes that tin, puts it on the fire and starts cutting the no, stuff. The actual, boil, the actual water he used to boil. And he was just like, looked at each other tea. and we were like, oh, you know what, whatever. But since then, I was I haven't had like stomach problems. Right. So, and and also like, since then my like my perception of things also did change a little bit. Like I think like you know so that that that, that your gut and your stomach do have an effect on it. When you say since then, are you specifically talking about the scenario of the chai tea? Or I think it was just the, about the, just the general experience of the your general, travel through India. General experience. How long were you in India for? a month and a half and you found that had a profound change on you dude yo, that place will blow your mind like it'll it'll turn your head around completely Mm -hmm. like from the food and having to go through that experience of the physical like you know changes that that your body now goes through because you're being introduced to all these new viruses and all these Mm -hmm. different things and that like your body eventually I mean we evolve we adapt you know like I stopped having stomach problems and I used to have stomach problems a lot, but they are, I still have like some problems, but they're just like, you know, they're minor, but they've always been there since then. Um, but like there's like the, the actual culture, the, the experiences that you have, like their approach to dealing with, you know, like mental issues. It's, um, it's like, it's mind blowing, dude. Like around every corner, you'll find a little shrine somewhere and each shrine 
is dedicated to a certain god, which then can be related back to, you know, different mental states. You know, so, oh, okay, if I'm feeling like this, let me go pray to this god today. And you walk around the corner and you'll find that little, like, like little shrine and you go do your little prayers and whatever. Um, but, you know, like, like I, I love telling the story, but something that really, like, switched my head around completely, like, just, you know, like, it takes you out of where you think you are and just throws you into this place of where you know where the fuck you are. Mm-hmm. Um, we were trying to find our way back to our guest house. And, you know, in Varanasi, it's the town that's on the Ganges. It's where they do all the fires and where all the bodies are burnt and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's very narrow. You can see, like, there's still that old colonial kind of infrastructure, but still has that, like, very... Hindu and Indian style, like all the colors and stuff. But it's like you're literally like walking through the castles and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, the roads are very narrow. And the one night we were walking around, you know, it was our last night there. We're like, okay, let's go for a mission. Just makes a bit of a hash with the locals and we went for a walk. Um, and then we got lost. <laughs> and we're like, okay, shit, how do we get back home? So we just went trying to find a way back down to the river because, you know, okay, if we get there, we'll know where to get back to the guest house. Okay. And we were busy walking and, um, you know, in front of us, there was this dude, like this old man, very skinny, slinky guy. He had this massive, like, bag over his back. And, like, you know, it was too big for us to pass around. And we're like, what the hell is this? And we're like, and I'm watching, I'm looking at this thing. I'm like, you know, trying to find a way around. And it's like, oh, there's this weird, odd shapes in it. You know, some round, some very sharp. And you're like, what the hell? You know, and I'm looking, and then I see this stuff dripping on the floor. I'm like, what is that? And it's like this yellow kind of oily kind of stuff dripping. I'm like, follow it. And I follow it up to the bag and there's a, like a hole in the bag. Mm-hmm. And I just remember seeing the, like the ponytail of a girl's head. Wow. Dude, yes, like, you, like your whole body just goes, you're like, what the hell? And the second we got a space, dude, I just bolted and my friend started running with me and I was like, why? He's like, did you see that asshole? I'm like, did you see that? Like, that, that was real, right? We saw that, that was, like, was, the, that was someone's head. That was like a person. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly the, the shape of the bag started making sense. It was elbows, it was the back of heads, it was knees. And freaks out, dude. We're like running, like, ah, oh my God, that's a serial killer. He's got yeah. like all these children in the bed. Meanwhile, he's probably just an undertaker. Dude, we get, we get to the guest house. And I'm like, call the police. He was just, there's this man, he's carrying children in a bag. And the guy starts laughing. Yeah. In your brain is like already like what the hell just happened? And you're you're like, probably not the first person to go to the guest yeah, house. Yeah, <laughs> report the serial killer. No, no, no. Let, let me explain. <laughs> and he explained it's like because you know they've got the caste system, mm. and you know in very nasty there's families whose job it is to like the one family like they've been doing it for two thousand years. They keep the fire going. That's all they do. That's it. People bring them food and stuff, and they just keep that fire going because it's the same fire that they use to light the pyres. Because it's important uh, from a cultural standpoint. And it was this guy's job to go pick up the children who had died in the night and put mm. them into the river so they could go to heaven. Mm. And like since I like, like my brain just went... Poof. Right. And yeah, to, how different our culture is to theirs and uh, the connection that they have. Yeah, and then it. just to see how they deal with these different things made me now approach my life in a different way. Mm. And how do I start treating myself? And you start using these different paradigms and you know systems to treat myself. I think we in South Africa, especially as white English-speaking South Africans, we, we are definitely uh, still very much part of our colonial past. We very westernized the... Uh, we, we are basically an extension of England. A lot of us English speaking, white South Africans and the Afrikaans as well, or they at least have a little bit of cultural independence where they, they're very much South African. And obviously South Africa's black communities, they obviously also all have their own cultural independence, but we're very westernized. I think uh, we adapt very easily to American yeah. culture. We adapt very easily to most European cultures as well. And I think this is where uh, we have that disconnect from cultures like in India and even from our very own. Yeah, you know, we yeah. flabbergasted when we go into Trans Sky and experience some sort of cultural experiences from our very own country. Um, Laura, you've not really discussed in detail your nutritional effects. If, if your sort of diet veers from, from a healthy diet, how you're affected by it. I know I just get, I get very sluggish and lazy mm-hmm. and very easily. Um, so this week sort of been busy um with being back at work and things and getting takeaways mm-hmm. and then almost because of those takeaways the night before 
I'm even lazier the next day and we have to get takeaways again. Right. <laughs> um, so that kind of thing. But again, with my most recent trip to my neurologist, um, things that I'd picked up on from myself, but to hear from him um, with regard to TLE particularly, um, it's quite interesting that high protein diet is mm-hmm. very good. Avoiding, um, avoiding bread and, and carbohydrates to an extent a need for iron and zinc in particular, mm-hmm. and avoiding um, folic acid, right. which I'd never heard of before, but it made so much sense. Um, I get really bad migraines, yeah. and folic acid um, causes headaches in TLE, mm-hmm. which is very interesting to know, you know, from a, a scientific point of view, not just my own um, experiences. Right. And then, um, as, as we were saying, so you, you've got a lot of information from your neurologist. How long have you been seeing a neurologist? Um, how long has he been helping you? Um, so my neurologist now, I've been seeing, gosh, since like 2014. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, when I first went to him, we wanted, well, my parents at that point were like, okay, I just want to know what the actual diagnosis is. And I was very anti going onto medication that, at that time. Um, which is the first thing that impressed me about him is that he he was very happy with me not going on to medication. Mm-hmm. He was happy to just say, okay, this is what you've got. This is what I would put you on. If you don't want to be on it, that's fine. Come back to me if you ever do need me. Um, he's also been very happy with helping me come off of my medica- off of some of my medication um, just for, for personal reasons mm-hmm. um, and very supportive in that manner. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so he he was explaining to you that a high protein diet uh, sort of reduced carbohydrates, mm. probably especially complex carbohydrates like breads yeah, and yeah. white potato, white rice rather. If you are going to have have things that are high in protein like sweet potato, uh, yeah. brown rice, things like that. Exactly. Uh, what's very difficult for you and probably something that you have to supplement is the zinc and the iron because, uh, like Damien was saying, you sort of closer aligned to a vegetarian diet, although you, you're not strict about it. You yeah. just follow a vegetarian di- diet more closely. I, I, I try to. I was vegetarian for about seven and a half years. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, um, my anemia actually went away when I was vegetarian. Interesting. Um, yeah, spinach has a remarkable amount of iron in it, uh-huh. um, more so than a lot of the meat right, we yes. eat. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then I got sick and was craving meat and it helped me get better and I sort of haven't quite gotten back to full, vegetarian. full vegetarianism mm-hmm. since then. Right. So, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, like you say, spinach is quite high in iron and higher than most of our meat products. Uh, but that's also down to that most of our meat products, we, we choose muscle fibery meats. We enjoy having minced meat, uh, which is fats and mm. muscle fiber meats, steaks is muscle fiber meats, whereas the organ meats are quite mineral rich. Yeah. The, the scary thing with us in our modern diets is the amount of antibiotics that is in a lot of our mm. farmed cattle, especially grain-fed cattle instead of grass-fed cattle, antibiotics. The big problem with that is we want this mineral-rich organ meats, kidneys and livers and things, which is normally tremendously cheap at the butcher and you're getting the best types of minerals from it. The big problem is that it's also the processing parts of the body, so any sort of bad stuff that the animal's having or if you're having a particularly antibiotic full animal that's also all inside that organ meat uh, in quite a quite a <coughs> concentrated manner as well mm. so there's a sort of balancing act and uh, approach that we need to have to our food is is that we need we need to concentrate on how that affects us yeah individually I mean, you even know? when we're eating what we consider as healthy food it's so often so heavily processed in any case mm. that it's, it's lost most of the nutrients yeah, well, uh, we unfortunately victims of, of food marketing as well. We look at like fat-free and low-fat milks, which uh, I think do have their place. I'm not uh, attacking it completely, but it's absolutely not the place that we think it has yeah. and it's not mm. the place that, that it's been marketed as. It's not something that's going to r- remove obesity. Actually, full cream milk is going to be far better for you if you're trying to lose weight than fat-free or low-fat milk because it's so full of sugars. Whereas mm. full cream milk has no added sugars. Um, and uh, the major problem with full cream milk is actually people with dairy intolerances, you know, so if it aggravates your gut, a full cream milk is going to be quite quite horrible for you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's people do need to concentrate on their diets and their nutrition and monitor your mental health as well. Yeah. I mean, also, so going back to the antibiotics thing, I mean, Laura, and you, well, how long were you in hospital for? Maybe just under a week. 
Yeah, just because a pharmacist gave her the wrong antibiotic. Mm. Oh, the, the GP prescribed yeah, the an GP. antibiotic that at that point I was on an SSRI antidepressant and the antibiotic um, was an SSRI inhibitor. Mm. So it was basically not just fully stopping the, anti the um, antidepressant from going right. into my it's brain, but mm -hmm. letting it in in sort of blasts. Um, right. So it was like coming off and going back on. Um, well, I'm, I'm not a fan of antibiotics. I think that they're absolutely necessary to treat very specific things mm. like infection. Mm. Uh, you need to have antibiotics to treat infection. Infection can cause high fevers, which can have more adverse effects, even death. So it's something that we do have to treat, but I'm absolutely a proponent for uh, last resort for antibiotics. Yeah, uh, antibiotics affect me horribly. I feel depressed. I feel unwell. Uh, I feel lethargic. I really don't enjoy antibiotics. Yeah. Um, Same. Damien, we, we were discussing something that we sort of glossed over a little bit earlier, and you were talking about your, your life in Rosettenville for that chaotic period. Um, and you you mentioned a gram per day. Was this, you were uh, yeah, battling a... Yeah, I was battling a pretty bad uh, Addiction habit. to uh, recreational drug usage. Yeah. Um, just to cathinine. And because like the, and now, like especially after having that, the last session with the neurologist where he explained, you know, your brain's craving adrenaline. Mm -hmm. It made sense. I was like, oh, so that's why. Right. You know, that's because, you know, it, it wasn't like this whole like, oh my God, no, I need to go have, I need to go have, mm -hmm. rrr, rrr, kind of thing. It was just more like I needed to function. I needed mm -hmm. to, I was working seven days a week. I was getting home and like, you know, once I'd finished classes, I'd get home the guys already knew me, I'd drive past, I'd just go like this, I'd drive around the block, done, go get ready, go get, go start delivering pizzas. Mm, and you um, were self-medicating in a sense. Yeah, and then I was also, then that's when I also started experimenting with um, like some of the, the herbal supplements, mm -hmm. which also started having, you know, adverse effects as well. Like I learned um, St. John's wort, which is an antidepressant, is not very good for people with epilepsy, because it'll induce seizures. Mm -hmm. um, but also like under different dosages like now I'll have it every now and again um, but like uh, the, the dosage I was having at the time was very mis like you know dosaged you know because on the, on the little thing it says they take two to four mm -hmm. and you'd have to have like four because you think okay no this will make me feel better and then you end up having like a seizure at the end mm -hmm. of the day because your dosage is far too half yeah it. whereas like now I've found you know the, the people that I get from it's the same people that supply for Diskim Mm -hmm. uh, health and herbs you know those like little green boxes where you can have like the teas and stuff right it's those guys they actually have like an entire other range of supplements that have some very good nice very nice herbs which is like mm -hmm. your skeletium your saint john's wort um ginkgo uh, what else was it that we like passion flower valerian um you just also you have to do a lot of research mm -hmm. you really need to do research on this stuff before you know don't don't take the route that i did i did the right. routes the bad route so no one else could so i know what right. not to do mm -hmm. um but yeah you like really do your research but then also once you do find something that kind of works find um you know the correct dosage and amount i think i think this is this is an important piece of advice that you you're giving to people is that uh, even if your treatment you're seeking is holistic it doesn't mean it's necessarily risk-free completely 100 mm. percent. Oh, yeah, and i think this is a perception that a lot of people have is because i'm i'm having something natural uh it's something that i'm going to just immediately try without even doing the research because it's not going to have adverse effects i think their biggest fear with natural treatments is that it's not going to be effective enough oh, for them rather so than thinking it about the risks of the side effect or over effective or uh, it will accelerate certain yeah. things and, that, that and that's you... something that also happens so say if you start taking a herbal supplement for something that you don't have it'll create it mm. So if you start taking, um, you know, I have, uh, what's it? It's called serotonin syndrome. So it's when your brain goes with serotonin yeah. and it just goes like blasts of it. Right. Yeah, it like freaks out. And that was induced by taking too many of these herbal supplements thinking, oh no, you know, it's just going to make me happy. I'll be able to function better. I'll be able to do this. You know, let me just, but I was also, you know, I was, I was in that state. In that. What were the herbal supplements you were taking for serotonin boosters? Uh, what was that? 
it was, I was there was a 5 HTP, mm-hmm. you know, stuff you can get from Discord. Yeah, 5 HTP is, is sort of the natural serotonin. And with, so 5 HTP like. and Skeletium are like, mm-hmm. you know, brothers and sisters. Very well related. Closely um, related to me. And there was, I was playing around with GABA, G A B A, um, the, but it was the St. John's Wort that really, you know, it wasn't the. I really, I, I enjoyed the feeling. I enjoyed how it made me feel and how I started experiencing things. But then I started realizing, okay, there's this other side to it, you know, because it would create this almost euphoric fairy tale kind of feeling. It's not like mm-hmm. you're like, like you're tripping or something. It's just a slight little, you know, okay, today feels nice. It feels good. You know, wow, that's a very pretty sunset. Right. Whereas the other side was that where we get to the point where you were now, where it was almost like a trip. Yeah, where you're experiencing life actually more vividly. Yeah, but and then, but then the other side would be that it would be too vivid. Right. The your memories would go, and you start having deja vu and flashbacks, and you just start disorientating and not knowing where you are. And and um, it was something that was actually like unrealistic. It's, yeah. It's, then it became unrealistic, and that's why I was like, okay, you know, what? no, this isn't working for me. Um, but then also I was taking ginkgo to help with my memory and concentration and stuff. Um, and I was also like, you know, after a while I got, I was scared and I didn't, I stepped away from all of that stuff and I just kept to the cannabis and, you know, just what else was it? Like, like omega threes, omega threes. Yes. Essential fatty acids. Yeah. Very, yeah, very good for, it, it's like mostly lube. for gut flora. Mm. And it's, it's like lube for your brain. Do you remember that like in the, the research and everything of all of this, that although like us, for example, although we've got the same, the same thing with TLE, it doesn't mean our chemical makeup is still the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, with Damien saying the cannabis works so well for him, like for me, the CBD works fantastically, but give me THC and I'm an anxious This is mess. actually something I wanted to it's ask. Is the, uh, the, the anxiety is, it's actually quite strange how CBD is probably the, the best natural treatment we have mm-hmm. for anxiety now. All of the research is sort of showing that the, the safest way to treat your sort of anxiety is CBD. Uh, and very effective. Whereas THC, on the other hand, causes so much paranoia and mm. anxiety mm. and things like that. So it's quite interesting that you bring that up, is that you, you could have the CBD oil with the THC removed. Yeah. You know, cannabis so, oils with, with, with THC removed, and, yeah. and that's massively beneficial to you. Yeah, CBD oil does me wonders, but so, I mean, if I was to go just smoke a joint or something, major panic attacks and not a very pleasant person to be around. Yeah, but that's also like, you know, I don't even, I don't really smoke anymore either. I mm-hmm. just, I cook. So, I'll, you know, have my stuff, sometimes homegrown, sometimes I'll trade and get from someone else or something. Um, but also I like experimenting. I like, you know, trying the different strains and seeing what the different effects are, but I don't like smoking. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll smoke if it's a last resort, like if I'm down to, if I'm almost finished for, with my supply and I'm, you know, trying to ration supplies, which has now been for like the past like week or so. And I, I'm starting to feel the, the seizures and the, the petty mal starting to come up again. I'm starting to have the deja vu. I can feel that, like, those instances of disassociation and, like, okay, I don't recognize something. Uh, but, yeah, I cook with it. I just, I make, I literally, I make my, like, coffee in the morning. So I've got my little process, my little desk with all my little herbs and stuff. It's my little, like, witchy table. And I'm like, okay, I crush it, I make the powder, and I put it on the oven, and I cook it, warm it up, put some butter in, and then I add that to my coffee, and then that's me sorted for the day. Right. I even had a comment of someone at work the other day being like, you're like, how do you get to work so happy all the time? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have some, some herbal help there. Um, yeah. So this is actually something, this is actually quite a good segue into this, is that... Uh, you've been speaking about deja vu and uh, you know uh, hallucinations I think Mm. this is something that was terrifying for you in your youth in particular see that's the thing it wasn't terrifying because you didn't you don't really notice it and that's 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 what's actually scary is because then the whole question it's not oh my gosh I'm seeing a a pink elephant flying by it's like was that real or was did I imagine that like when it'll be normal stuff, like a conversation. Um, so it's not like the very obvious hallucinations yeah, it's that, not that the people get on like, LSD and and acid. But even and, even like with that stuff, like I've never seen a pink elephant. So right for you, <laughs> you didn't experience like severe, like obvious hallucinations yeah, it's, it's that, was, that some people might experience, but obviously for you. Um, and and again, this is possibly something that a lot of people, like someone who operates in the normal uh, operating realms of brain function. So, you, you know, the, the average 
brain function uh, realms. Someone who then smokes a joint there perhaps won't experience hallucinations necessarily with the THC kick, they'll just experience the high. Mm. Is that something that you experienced when, when you were, did you find that you were experiencing different amounts of effects from things like THC uh, yeah. to other people? Um, so when I was younger, because I only, only found like, started getting involved in cannabis and stuff when I was like 21 or 22, mm -hmm. despite what everyone thinks, everyone thought I was a stoner from like birth or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, like honestly, dude, like I hadn't touched weed until I was like, I think I tried to smoke a joint once when I was like 15 and I just hated it. I didn't like it. I didn't mm -hmm. like what it, what it did. And it was only later on in varsity when, uh, you know, after my granddad and stuff that I started, you know, trying it. And um, what, was really, what was really funny is that my marks started improving. Right. And after second year, I started getting A's and stuff and I was performing well and I was doing, you know, I could actually sit down and read a textbook because I could focus whereas before I was like you know I'd read like three lines and then my head like would drift off into some other different realm, realm imagining what, what, what I just read um, but yeah like I did notice that you know the hallucinations would be triggered by um, fear so if I'm, if I'm in a bad state of mind and I smoke a joint or something, then I'm gonna start having these different, you know, very like negative kind of hallucinations. And, then, and the thing is, is that they're subtle. They're not obvious enough to recognize that it's a, that's a, it's a hallucination. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it'll be like, the most common one that I used to have was, if I smoked a joint, um, I would hear people talking about me, like, you know, the neighbors, or I'd hear someone over the wall planning to break in or something and like that kind of stuff. So the THC caused paranoia quite severely. With yeah. You. So that's why like now, like I've gotten it down to a very precise point of knowing, okay, this is how much I have to put in because, you know, THC does have its benefits. It does. It does. But have not benefits. when it's, mm -hmm. it's too much. Mm -hmm. So I do prefer the CBD a lot, but I also don't because it then makes me too lazy uh, and lethargic and, uh, and you're like then almost mm. become depressed right. whereas with just that like right amount so it is about finding that right balance of all the things to get to that perfect balance whereas like now especially with cooking it it's very different to smoking like if I smoke I feel that like you know you get that like that rush and it's a bit of like oh my god you know, I'm getting paranoid or something mm -hmm. but then you also you know I've learned now to like brush it off and you know, Again, change the, the consciousness side yeah, of things. Change the state and just change the direction. Like I know, like okay, if you smoke a joint and you, it, it'll, it'll, um, you know, it'll enhance whatever you're doing. So if I'm, I used to love smoking before before dancing or doing voice because mm -hmm. I would get so into it. You know, you'd mm -hmm. stop having to think about things. You just express and you'd really get into it. Um, but then also sort of realizing that okay, if I have a joint and I don't do anything, then I become extremely lazy. Right. And you become depressed and it's like, oh, okay. So, uh, whereas now I've gained that conscious control over it to know, okay, you know, if I feel that because it's a bit of like the paranoia is kicking, I'm like, no, it's not paranoia. It's just your head. Remember, you're fine. Everything's okay. And then poof, five minutes later, I'm like, let's go party. Let's go do something. I'm feeling creative. I want to create. Let's go make. Uh, so the piano and just play. And, right. Um, but yeah, it, it, you really do have to find that balance. That's why I like, you know, I'm an advocate for it, but at the same time, I'm not. Mm -hmm. because I don't think, I think it's, it's a, I think it's incredibly dangerous for certain people yeah uh, I think there's there's a lot of claims that uh, that THC can onset schizophrenia mm. for people who are susceptible to it uh, I'm not too certain about the accuracy of those claims I believe no, 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 it no, that it's, it's in very high dosages so people yeah. who consume a lot of marijuana can become schizophrenic but they have to be susceptible to that change as yeah. well like uh, yeah. exactly <laughs> And I think, I think that's one of the things that people need to be very cautious of with this miracle drug that is cannabis. Yeah. And, and it, you know, the reason why it is described as a miracle drug is it does have massive benefits. And, and those benefits, as much as they've been sort of tried to swat them away from major corporations and things, they are true and they are still there. But that also doesn't mean that we need to switch all the way over to the mm. other side and be put all of our faith into it 100 percent. yeah because i mean it's like with everything everything in moderation there is no be all end all cure yeah. and i think i think what's nice to hear from you guys and one of one of your big messages is about achieving this balance point where you you try to reach a functional balance point that that you function best at life and and a lot of it comes from consciousness a lot of it comes from treatments a lot of it comes from diet and nutrition and all of these things and i think that's sort of the goal of anyone 
with a mental illness is trying to find yeah, this balance even, point. Even know? people without. Yeah, yeah. You know, like just finding that balance and finding that that ritual and routine and stuff or you know, just it's beneficial in, in general. Like for us we just do it because we need to survive. Right. <laughs> for other but people. for people yeah. who are operating in normal in the realms of, of normal brain function. Yeah. I mean they're still affected by their hormones and you know chemical changes and things, whether you it's an illness or not, it's still there and it still has an effect. Absolutely, especially women with the yeah. hormonal changes that you experience with massive peaks at certain times, at certain periods, yeah, yeah. And, and the fluctuations are so fast and heavy. And, and I think this is something that affected you, Damien, as well. We were discussing that you, you had these fluctuations when you came off of medication and that be, the rapidness of that change affected you so badly. Mm. And I think that's what's interesting about women, the difficulties that they have to go through is, is the rapidness of the change of the hormones, whereas with men, obviously, quite a lot more consistent. So we, we do have hormonal changes. Uh, a lot of men experience depression that they've never experienced. They only get it in their forties, and it happens due to the massive dips in testosterone that they have. But it, at least it's gradual. You know, yeah. it's not these these very like, rapid mm, changes mm. in hormones. Whereas, like for like a person with TLE, they become accustomed to those rapid changes. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, my, my my TLE does um, get a bit more hectic at certain times of the month. Yeah, this this is actually something that I wanted to question. It's the hormones do affect yep, your the so. symptoms of your TLE. Definitely. And then also it makes you know the, like you know me like also I'm very susceptible. You know, you could mm-hmm. say the empath or whatever that the, the neuro term is. Um, it's just because you know, have being in the states, you grew up having to learn how to watch other people and know okay how to change yourself and whatever state you're in to adapt to the situation, which makes you then, you know, you're very susceptible, you're very observant of people. Like with Lara, like, I'm like this, like I'll just say, I was like, I'm like, I just, she'll come and she'll lose her shit and I'll be like, three days. And she's like, damn it. And because three days later, she'll start her period. period right, so you've, you've actually learned her, uh, her emotions and she has like triggers that, that she sends off to you, like actual physical, um, yeah, you know, like certain words she'll say. She only says certain things at that time. And I'm like, right. three, days. three days. And then <laughs> she's either like, oh, and angry. Or she's like, oh, thank God, that's what it is. Like it's an understanding. Yeah, yeah. I just lost it completely. Right. Um, what I wanted to discuss uh, in quite, quite a bit more detail is the hallucinations. I think that's quite interesting. And especially because it's something so far away from people's general understanding of TLE. And I don't know if it's something, as much as you guys have the same condition, you don't have the same symptoms. And Laura, I don't know if you've experienced hallucinations to the same extent that Damien has. Um, I ha- yeah, I have experienced hallucinations quite a bit. The most common are auditory hallucinations. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also sort of seeing things and stuff. Gen- most of those sort of symptoms come more when I'm, I'm tired. Mm-hmm. Um, so like sort of if I'm lying down about to fall asleep, that's when I start... It's almost like my brain goes into dream mode before mm. the rest of my body shuts down. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, hearing things is happens quite often. And again, I think Damien sort of mentioned, it's not so much what you see or hear that's necessarily scary. It's not like these horror images and things. What's scary is more, you know, what to trust. It's knowing which is real and which is not. Okay. And I find it quite interesting that you're talking about when you're tired and as you're about to fall asleep, obviously the sleep hormone being melatonin and we can get melatonin from uh, milk chocolate, from milk itself. You know, I mean, the whole mm. old wives tale of drink a warm glass of milk before bed and, and you'll sleep better is actually based in, in reality is that it's very high in the hormone melatonin, which, which assists with sleep. Uh, however, if you take melatonin inducing drugs it can cause hallucinations you know sleeping tablets yeah. very heavily cause hallucinations and i wonder if that's something aligned mm. to that is that it's the increased melatonin hormone as you're about to fall asleep then reacts with your condition and then these hallucinations that's, are quite heavily onset yeah that's i think that's a pretty good sum up assumption yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but once again none of us are trained yeah. doctors uh, mm. none of us are qualified to to diagnose anything we're just talking about life experience yeah. Yeah. Uh, so your your hallucinations mostly auditory uh, similar to you Damien yeah no okay so um, but I, I used to have those auditories like when I from when I was a kid like the the most common one was hearing my name <laughs> I run through the house like yes I was like what are you talking about no, no one's, one's calling, calling you, you. Mm-hmm. yeah um, 
you know, then that also kind of goes back to that esoteric side, which is also, you know, I find myself, you know, diving more into that stuff as well, because it would explain the things without, you know, having been, having to be scientific about it. It's like, okay, this is what you're experiencing. This is how you can deal with it. You know, and it's all like, you know, psychological structures that you can use and apply and changing your paradigm. Like I love like the word paradigm, because it is, that's what it is. You, your, your brain is gets into a certain system and then you have to either change it or ride with it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, I, I don't like saying like that, you know, it's a mental illness. I just say it's a mental, um, what's the word? State, almost. Okay. Yeah, it's like a difference. It's not like because it's an illness when it affects you negatively. Like there are the negative sides, obviously, like if you have a really bad seizure, um, you know, where you actually physically get damaged and mm -hmm. your body, like, you know, I remember waking up with a blood, with a pillow covered in blood because my, half my tongue sitting on the pillow. Um, but then there was that other side to it, which I actually kind of miss now which was the, that, that almost magical side to it. You know, it would feel like you're living this magical life. You were more able to be creative during those mm. times, especially from like a creative standpoint. We find a lot of creatives are, don't operate within the normal realms of mental uh, state, you know? So yeah. uh, I think that's what you're saying is, is uh, you, you, you don't feel you have a mental illness, you have mental variety. You, That's you sort the of word not, variety. Like that. Like yeah, that. so like that, that you you're not uh, you're not suffering from your condition necessarily. You're just operating uh, outside of the realms of normal mental operation, yeah. you know, of, of normal brain operation. You're operating outside of those realms, especially now that you're at the point where you you're managing it, because mm -hmm. it, it's certainly mental illness when you when you're at the point where you can't manage, where yeah. where you're suffering severely from depression, bipolar disorder, from those effects, uh, you're suffering, he suffering heavily, I can't speak either, um, you're suffering very heavily from seizures, for example, physical seizures, things like that. I think when, when any of that is affecting your daily life, you, you very clearly have a mental illness, go seek treatment, please, please, please. And um, if, you, if you're not uh, being negatively affected in your daily life, then you know perceive it as mental variety and sort of encourage those around you to to accept that that you're diverse in your mental state rather than uh, try to operate within the normal realms because that's where you're going to start losing these things like personality when we discussed that mm -hmm. medication was helping you achieve the state of normalness you know the, this this normal operating state but you lost so much of yourself yeah. within that you lose personality yeah. you lose your creative ability you're losing so much uh, by by using the drugs to bring you into this normal state uh, whereas you have to weigh up when that's worth it hmm. i mean like the, the post that got this conversation even happening was exactly, yeah. me having a depressive state and i was like okay i know how to get myself out of this let me write Mm -hmm. And I just started writing. Um, you know, there's also like why, like, you know, my director loves hearing my ideas because I have these very, like, I can have these, like, crazy messed up ideas because I can tap into the horror of, you know, something happening because mm -hmm. I know what that experience is. Like, you know, like... You have the life experience for it. Yeah, and then, like, he's like, Jesus, where the hell did you get that idea from? Like, oh, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but also it's something that, you know, grinds me. And I'm saying, okay, it's, it's my personal opinion. But also maybe it's because I've had to learn how to deal with it by myself and, you know, never really had a lot of support for it, apart from, you know, like the school and, you know, being accepted. And I see there's a difference between being accepted and having support. Mm -hmm. there, there is. Like, there's you know, OK, this is we see that that's happening. We know why it's happening and it's, it's OK. But, you know, there was never really that, you know, what, let's help you fix this. Let's change that. So, you know, I always I learned how to deal with it by myself. And I think they, they accepted it. Like you said, acceptance, support, and then there's also the further point beyond that is understanding. Yeah. I think I think those are sort of the three varieties that you have to look at from a community standpoint, mm. a family standpoint, uh, a friends and relationships standpoint, and then obviously schooling and the workplace. Is that we need to try and achieve all of these mm. states for people who are sufferers of any conditions like this. Is we we need to try and have acceptance first of all. I think that's the first step. Um, so that you're not demonizing or villainizing anyone who's who's a sufferer yeah. of anything. I think uh, the next point is uh, complete understanding, is to actually go on and educate yourself and understand what you're going through rather than 
just support, you know. So, mm. so I think you had a lot of acceptance and, and you sort of lacked a little bit f- uh, from the understanding point of view. Uh, education was still poor 20 years ago on what was happening and then support you lacked severely still as well. Yeah, um, it's just because, you know, okay, well, there's a, a friend, a friend, his girlfriend, <laughs> um, was just recently, like, diagnosed with bipolar. Okay. And this now, you know, it has it's, only now that the... It's this idea of, like, oh, my God, I've got bipolar, my world is ending. It's like, mm-hmm. you've had bipolar the whole time. The diagnosis isn't isn't a sentence the diagnosis is actually setting you free because now you know what you can do mm. to feel better and function better like Yo. the diagnosis should help and that you can get help i think that's what, what i think that's what podcasts like this need to do and this is what we're trying to achieve is to remove the fear from Yo. those sort of things by educating them and it's i think it's one thing for a doctor to come in here and, and say what you've just said and it's another thing for someone who has life experience in it and i think it, it's uh you're encouraging people to feel liberated rather than fear when yeah, they, are, when exactly they receive it. their it's diagnosis. Like, it's, um, yeah, it, it almost, because we're, like, we're vets, you know, we're seasoned vets, <laughs> um, it's, it's almost annoying when you see like this person who's just been diagnosed and you're like, oh, it's like, shame. It's like a diagnosis is being like a cut, say, on your leg. Mm. You know, before that, you know there's something wrong. You know there's a cut. But where do you put the plaster? And you yes. know you find where it is. Now you know where to put the plaster. You know what you Absolutely. need to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> you, you're like in pain and suffering. It's like uh, like standing on a thorn. Oh, why is my foot in pain? You turn your f- foot upside down, you see the thorn, and you remove the thorn. Until you've seen that thorn, it's more terrifying because you don't know where yeah. the pain is. Mm. From. Once you see the thorn, it's you actually get that point of liberation. You know what steps of action mm. to take. Yeah, that's it. Like, well, that's why I love that phrase. I'm going to keep that. The mental variety. It's like, don't be scared of it. Use it to your advantage. I like it as well. I, I agree with you. And I think, I, I hope that it brings other people uh, liberation. I think, I hope that it brings other people clarity and comfort in their conditions you know i hope that it brings someone comfort where if you're not suffering if it's not affecting your daily life in such a negative way treat it as mental variety and and stop trying to necessarily force your brain to conform because there's beauty in your mental variety there's there's beauty in diversity the dark that come for every like dark that comes with it comes 10 times more color and light that's exactly yeah and that's it it's like I would I would never give this up I'd rather you know I'd suffer with the seizures and stuff because you know the other side is experiencing life in a completely different way like Mm -hmm. seeing the world from a different perspective like you're not just in this box that you have to now move along with you're outside of the box taking a surf on the freaking wave that's it and you're going wherever you want with it I think the next step in that is is I mean obviously I still live daily with my ADHD and uh, it doesn't affect me negatively in the slightest way and I've managed to keep my personality without being on on the drugs that would would make me concentrate at, which would help me get through school etc I think that's the next step that we need to take as a society and a community is to restructure our society and our community to allow people's mental variety and this diversity to function better within the system and, and, and it's going to have to happen it's, it's, it's actually going to be necessary like actually I wrote my, um, my final research project on pretty much this it was also on, on the legalization and you know, the use of, of entheogens and how trans states work with using because in the end like what I was trying to do was I was trying to fix myself mm-hmm. and I was using my studies to do that I was really trying to find ways to okay how do I fix this how do I change this because if I can fix me then I can fix someone else right. and then someone else can deal with it and I realized there's nothing to fix. There is just accepting it. And you know, obviously when you do get into those very bad states, then you do need help, you do need support, you do need to go find a doctor and stuff. But if it's not that debilitating negativity, then it's, it's a gift, it's not a curse. Right. It's, you know, I enjoy being able to, you know, when I look at people, I don't just see a person, I see this entire storyline playing out. I see their facial expressions. I see like the little micro expressions. I see all these little things I notice. I'm like, oh, look at the color of their shoes. Look at this. You know, I can stare at the, at the moon for an hour and just be like in awe because it's just so beautiful. Mm. And I know that, you know, for like people with a normal brain, working brain, they, you know, they, they don't necessarily always see those things. Yeah, and I think that, I think this is also a space to look at is that uh, within the realms of normal brain activity, 
you know, with, within the realms of normal brain activity, there is diversity within that spectrum as well. You know, so although your, your mental illness that you had, that you have now treated to get you to a point where you're functional, has not brought you into the realms of uh, the spectrum of normal brain activity, you, you're healthy and you're fine. But I think there's also variety within that spectrum. Mm as well so uh i think you know we're talking about people who operate in normal uh in the normal spectrum and you're saying that they don't see things the way that you do yes that is beautiful etc but i think it's also difficult to i think we all yeah, diverse you know yeah. it's a, there's a generalization that most people only see things this way it's also because our society allows us to only express what we see in that way i think we we grow up learning how to express ourselves as well and uh you and I see the same thing differently, but we express it the same way because we've grown up learning mm. how to express mm. ourselves. And I think this is another point that we need to change is that uh, for us to delve deeper into expression. Mm. And, and also like a, like a side note with the, the hallucinations, this is what I was trying to tap into like with the, you know, seeing things differently. Mm -hmm. um, it's like AR. Right. You know, it's you, like I, I, I'm looking at you right now, but if I let my eyes do a bit of change, like colors start coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And like literally like that, that's what I'm seeing. It's like all these different colors like flowing. It's almost like water. So, I, so it's what, what you'd normally experience with AI is looking at your phone and the, the camera's seeing the real physical world state and then this, it adds something in yeah. digitally. You, you, you're adding that in from your brain, you know, yeah. you, you're adding that in. Yeah, it's the, you know, it's like, um, like a, the one clear example that I used to have or still have is if I stare at, if I look at grass it could be the grass can be like you know dead still no wind but it'll still look like water it'll look like it's flowing like it's moving and I mean that'll happen with a lot of like um, intricate designs like that wall the, the knots and stuff mm -hmm. if I you know if I spend like five seconds looking at it those knots start moving right and that's the other you know the kind of hallucination that you don't really people don't really notice or think that that's what it is. And they hear hallucination, they're like, oh, you're going to see some scary Yeah, thing. so there's, there's, there's mild forms of the hallucination rather than tigers flying through the sky. Yeah, and, I mean, did, I remember sitting with a psychiatrist once and I had to explain to her what hallucinations were. I'm like, you're a doctor about to give me medication. And you don't have an you understanding have no idea. of my I had condition. to sit and explain. I was just mm -hmm. like, she's like, so you know when you see these lizards crawling on the wall, they're not real, right? And I was just like, yeah. I don't know if you know what you're talking about. Yeah, and I so have to explain. I'd be like, okay, you see this wood? You see this? This looks like it's moving. You know, it looks like it's water. Like, I know that it's solid and it's wood, but, like, the designs will move. Right. The if patterns, I, the yeah, pattern shifts. The patterns will shift. And that's, mm. like, you know, that's, that's the one. So you still have very uh, vivid vision for and a very clear um perception of the outlines of the table the distance from it so like your, your vision is fine so you're able to know when to stop your hand to avoid touching something you know that's why you're still able to ride a bike so you're still able to drive a car that's probably why i'm able to ride a bike a lot better because also my brain is so used to having to be quick and also you know the adrenaline of it um you know i function like that i function so much better like i'll put music in and i just start and i'll mm -hmm. go because I feel at home, I feel I can feel the flow, and it's almost, you know, I always imagine myself being this cheetah running amongst buffalo and elephants. You have a very vivid imagination. <laughs> exactly. Vivid imagination. But it, I get to work. Um, <laughs> and you get to work in a creative field, and I think this helps you. Um, guys, thank you so much for thank joining you, me. Man. I'd love to have you in again yeah. sometime to discuss this further. I hope this is helpful to people. Oh, I hope so too. Like. And also, you know, you know, we're not doctors or anything. No, of course. Personal, personal experience. experience. Yeah. Last bits of advice, anyone who's experiencing any symptoms? Go see a doctor. Sure, yeah. Go see a doctor, but... Someone you trust. Don't just, don't just, you know... Don't somebody tr you trust. Don't just take any answer as the only answer um, and get to know your, yourself and your, your mental state. Okay. Through, yeah. Yeah, also, also don't think that like one doctor is the be all like mm -hmm. if it doesn't feel right find another one right because a lot of people think okay no this person's going to know everything because they're, they're a right. doctor yeah so you just take the doctor's word for it or okay. Okay. Oh. so uh, be conscious try to be as conscious as possible if you're suffering and you're not able to live your daily life 
do something about it immediately. Don't wait. And second of all, if you're not happy with your doctor, find another one. And exercise. And exercise and eat healthy. Exercise and eat healthy and be creative. I Have often fun. complained about sort of feeling like a guinea pig in the initial stages, mm-hmm. um, but they will. They, there needs to be trial and error. Nobody's going to automatically know what to put you on or yeah. how to help you just from saying hello. There will be trial and error. Just give it some time. Okay. It's not an absolute accurate science. Yeah, don't be scared. Any shout outs, anything that you need to promote, anything you need to bump? Instagrams, uh, work, the school that you work at, anything like that? No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> no we're, we're pretty independent. Okay, so great. Shout out to, to um, my lovely wife. Oh, Or husband. Technically, <laughs> she's my husband. Uh, explain further, please. <laughs> so, um, we wanted to both get our names changed because we've got a civil union. Okay. Um, which is actually also mind blowing because. Okay, I might be wrong, but from what I understand is that gay people still can't get married. They can get a civil union. Not a civil marriage. Yeah. So it's all the same paperwork. Um, it just has a different name because, you know, Churches. Equality. And Churches. Mm. Um, um, so, um, yeah, we wanted to get that and be, you know, as equals. Mm-hmm. So we both wanted to change our surname and be Harry Smith, which would be really funny because <laughs> 10 years down the line, I'll rock up in Harry Smith and be like, where's my land? Right. Um, but apparently, we wasn't allowed to. Because uh, even with that, with the civil union, on the paper, it says there, partner A, husband, partner B, wife. And for me as the female to change my surname, obviously it would happen immediately, but for Damien to have his surname changed would take um, motivational letters and up to two years waiting period. And And I was was really done being Smith, so, (laughs) yeah. Uh, So I, uh, you know, decided to screw the system because they wouldn't let me do what I wanted. So I put myself down as wife and put her as husband. And they signed it off. Inequality? Um, I mean, equality. We put me down okay, as husband we and put me as wife. Uh, not you. Sorry, uh, okay. this, this sounds like a <laughs> massive problem in the system. Yeah. And it's something that I've never heard of before. And it's something that I'm going to discuss with some of the political podcasters that I deal with. Yeah. But uh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. Uh, Laura, Damien's husband, <laughs> Damien, Laura's wife. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for and having us. Thanks for Thank your you. insight. Thanks for sharing your stories. It's intimate. It's personal. Not a lot of people want to talk about that they were addicted to recreational drugs and living in Rosettenville for a time. Not a lot of people want to admit that they were homeless and just venturing around the country as a nomad. Uh, not a lot of people want to mention that they had the experiences and and the embarrassments that you had in India and things like that. So thank you so much for sharing. I think it's important and and I hope it encourages other people to share as well. Mm, Thank you so much. I hope so too. Thank you for sticking around and listening to the podcast. We really appreciate all our listeners. A uh, big thank you to Vodcast TV as well. This episode of the Marco Martins Revolution was brought to you by Vodcast TV, uh, Johannesburg's premier podcast studio platform. Visit vodcasttv.com right now for more.